Hello, son and daughter. Today, old Tex will put you asleep with set of horror stories that will reveal the horrifying secrets lurking in small, quiet towns. Do subscribe if you still didn't. Let's go. I lived alone in an old house and had a creepy stay. Again, the house was old. A huge house built in 1915 and converted into apartments for World War. One soldiers before they went overseas. I rented one apartment, about 1,000 square feet by itself, and the rest of the house was empty rooms and a giant staircase. As soon as I moved in, I met the next door neighbor. Rebecca, who about 30 seconds into the conversation, asked me if I knew the house was haunted. I laughed it off, but she insisted it wasn't safe. Wasn't worried, moved in, cleaned out a lot of junk, and fixed the place up as well as I could. Over the next few months, Rebecca and I ran into each other here and there, and each time she added to the story. Apparently, there was an old lady who lived in the apartment before me who never left never opened the windows, and never cleaned. She died in the apartment, and there was an estate sale to get rid of some of her stuff. Rebecca told me during the estate sale she'd gone into the basement and regretted it. About a week later, I decided to go check out the basement. I think partly to prove to myself I wasn't concerned. I was also curious. I'm not superstitious, and I don't believe in ghosts, but the occult is interesting to me. As soon as I stepped in the basement, I was creeped out. It smelled musty, but not like I have ever smelled before. Along the steps, there were burned-down candles that made bluish-gray wax puddles. The basement itself had two huge water heater tanks, also covered in wax and an empty concrete floor behind the tanks that had nasty-looking tiles around and more candles. Bizarre, but not haunted. At this point, I've lived in the apartment by myself for about three months, without any problem. My car got broken into one night, but that wasn't surprising given the neighborhood. Nothing strange had happened until the night I checked the basement. At 4 a.m., I bolted awake because I heard something in my room. This was odd for me because I sleep like a dead man. Sat in bed for a minute, heard nothing, and went back to sleep. Around 6 a.m., I had a night terror. Heard the noise again and woke up, but this time had sleep paralysis. I saw a black figure walk in my room and stop just inside the doorway. At this point, I think it's a robber, and I start trying to ask what he wants, but I can't speak or move. Nothing like this had ever happened to me before, and I was terrified. After the longest two, three minutes of my life, I willed myself out of sleep, and the whole atmosphere changed. No one was there. Nothing was out of place. No locks were broken. Nothing. I quickly got ready and showed up at work two hours before it opened. Over the next few weeks, I would hear the sound again here and there. It was a scratching and thumping sound, always very early in the morning. As soon as I would wake up, it would stop. Then one morning, it was especially loud. Still dark outside, 5 a.m. I heard it just behind the headboard of my bed. This time I made sure I was totally awake. I laid perfectly still and didn't even breathe, and I heard it again now, fully awake. There was definitely something in my room. After the sleep paralysis imaginary robber episode, I had bought a kid's baseball bat and sat next to my bed for self-defense. Can't afford a gun. I picked up the bat and slid out of bed. Every minute or so I would hear the rusting, scratching, thumping noise. It was in my closet. I stood outside the door, and my heart was pounding at this point. All the stories of the place being haunted, the creepy basement, the sleep paralysis episode, the weird early morning noises, all of it had built up in my mind and led to this moment. I was about to do battle with some evil force. I threw the door open and swung into the darkness, hitting nothing. I beat my clothes like a madman, but there was nothing in there. Then I heard a little scurry on the floor and saw something jump into one of my shoes. Upon closer inspection, it was a baby squirrel. I went outside later and found a hole in the roof. There was a family of squirrels living in my ceiling that was very active in the early morning, and one of the babies had somehow managed to find its way into my closet to scare the hell out of me. 
not haunted, just squirrels. This happened around three years ago, and thinking about it still makes me feel uneasy. I live in a rural area surrounded by a nature conservation area. There are many nice paths, and it's a great peaceful and quiet place to go for walks, ride bikes. On this day, I decided to take my dog for a walk there in the evening. I didn't want to go that far. For some reason, I decided to leave my phone at home, even though I usually take it with me, just in case. Everything was going well, and as usual, I barely met anyone. At some point, I got to my favorite spot, a wooded area. There is a field behind it, and I planned on walking all the way to the end. Then I wanted to turn around and take the same way home. As I continued walking after I made it through the wooded area, my dog started acting strange. She kept looking back and didn't want to go on. I thought she had spotted a deer or a rabbit and wasn't concerned. I didn't look around right away, but then she let out a little growl bark. I had never heard her do that before. I turn around and sure enough, there is a man standing on the edge of the wooded area field like maybe 10 meters next to the path. He was fully clothed and didn't move. He was just staring at us. My heart was pounding. No matter where I would go, I would still be in a secluded area for a while. I didn't think and just started walking quickly towards the end of the field. My dog still wasn't having it. When I turned around after getting a bit further away, he had also moved. Now he was standing on the field, still staring intensely. That's when I really knew we had to get going. I didn't look back until we got to the end of the field. Because of some trees, my view was obstructed. I couldn't see him, and my dog seemed a bit calmer. Obviously, I didn't want to stop for more than a few seconds, though. From there on, I decided to take the, the path that would take me to some part of my town the quickest. We literally ran, and I was so relieved when we made it back to civilization. I have no idea what his intention was. I'm just proud of my dog for alerting me. I work as a security guard on the graveyard shift. I think most guards have all gotten the heebie-jeebies a few times on this shift. I used to work at a large, semi-well-known meat processing plant. I remember it was about 2 a.m. and I was making my inside rounds, and I was walking down the third floor hallway. The third floor is basically just a bunch of electrical access panels and storage rooms. There are a few offices up there, but for the most part, there's nothing special up there. So I'm going along checking that doorknobs are locked, etc., making sure nothing looks broken, etc. Then my phone chimes. I'm like, who the F is messaging me this late? I pull out my phone and there's no message. I chalk it off as a notification for an app, but I don't see any notifications. Well, whatever, no big deal. Then about two minutes later, my radio turns on and I hear a static. Now this spooks me. No one else has access to radio at this point. I'm the only living human on the entire property, and all the other radios are under lock and key inside my guard check. Also, under lock and key. We wear a radio for formality, mostly. I can switch it to a different channel to talk with the one maintenance guy who's there, but he's not working this night, so it's like humming that's a little wired. I switch to that channel and I say security to M4. Are you there? M4 equals maintenance employee 4. There's three different guys that do it on a rotating schedule, but no reply. I hear the radio turn on again. This time it sounds like somebody is fumbling with the mic, but I can't hear any words. At this point I'm like, well, I guess I should go check it out. I make my way to the maintenance office. It's in the basement the one place I don't like to go because, for one, I always get weird feelings going down the stairs, and two, the entire basement is just a bunch of access tunnels and generators. It's pretty much a maze just beckoning to get you to be lost in. So I go down there the whole time my radio is randomly turning on and shit. I get to the office, and as expected, it's locked, lights are off, etc. 
I breathe a sigh of relief and turn to go, thinking ill just write this down on the daily report as malfunctioning equipment. But as I start to almost walk around the turn in the hallway, I hear the sound of the maintenance door unlocking. I stop dead in my tracks and turn around. My heart is kind of beating harder at this point. I reach for my tase gun and ready it, aiming it out before me while I go back to the office. Lights are still off. Can't see a damn thing in there. For a food five minutes, I stand at the door questioning if this is worth it. Do I make enough for this kind of BS? What if there's a criminal in there? How would that even be possible? Did someone sneak up on me? Am I going to die in a minute? I finally said if it and pushed the door open and reached in and flipped on the lights. Nothing. No one is in there. I look under the desk, constantly on edge. I see nothing. I look at the desk surface, see if there's any notes, etc., but nothing. I start to sigh of relief, and then the lights suddenly turn off, and the door locks itself. I freak the F out and switch on my mag light and swing around. As I'm swinging around, I see a shadow move away from the light. My eyes see it, and mentally I freak the F out, but I force myself to ignore it while I fumble to get my keys out to unlock the door. To do so, I have to turn the flashlight off so I have both hands. The whole time I have my back turned to the door. I feel like I'm being watched by something sinister. I eventually get the door unlocked and step out into the hallway. I turn around, flip the lights on, see nothing. Turn them off, shut the door, and lock it. I look at my watch. It's like 2.30 a.m. ish. I lean up against the hallway wall, breathing heavily. My mind replaying everything in my head, trying to figure out what the EU have just happened. I eventually give up and hurriedly make my way back to the first floor. I get back to the first floor, and at this point I have no desire to go back to the third floor. I can do it some other time. So I eventually make it to the exit, and just before I walk out the door to go outside to my guard shack, the radio turns on and there's some static, and I faintly hear someone laugh. Just a short like, ha-ha. And then it's dead. I yank my radio out of my pocket clip and look at it. I go to turn on the mic to say like F you or something, but my radio's totally, utterly dead. I live in North Texas near a large wildlife refuge in a lake bigger than my hometown. One night I had a fantastic idea to go down the long gravel road to the dock with a female friend of mine. I'm from Texas, so I usually carry, but opted to leave my gun locked in the glove box by the gate. About 30 yards into the trek, the road was about 200 yards to the dock. I hear an unnerving noise on my left. It was as if the earth itself growled and rumbled at me. I looked around frantically, trying to pinpoint the sound. Nothing. We stood still, waiting for it to resume. Instead, we hear just heavy footsteps, not crashing or rustling like a bear or a pig does, but heavy pacing. I turn to my friend and ask if she wants to go back. She didn't know, but wanted to get out of there. So we keep on our journey to the dock with the unnatural growling, rumbling following us, coupled with the heavy paces. I'm terrified by this point instinctively reaching for my right hip to find a blank space where a holster should be. I had left my pistol locked in the glove box. I grab my pocket knife and palm it aggressively. The rumbling continues, almost impacting the air with its weight. We hasten our pace, and it matches ours, but never coming out of the woods to show itself. This continues for about 300 yards. The entire time I am absolutely terrified. I've been hunting and camping since I was six, and I've never heard a sound like this one, or even had an experience similar. Finally arriving to the dock, she sprints out to the edge, and I grab a handful of rocks and go sit beside her. For the next 15 minutes, it circles the area around the dock landing, emanating the rumbles and growls. Nothing we can do. It's dark. I have no firearm, and we can't see it. I call my buddy Dennis, who lives five minutes away. The rumbling and pacing continues, roughly 30 to 40 yards away from us, but it doesn't step foot on the dock. 
Finally, I see headlights come up over the trees and the rumbling fades into darkness. Dennis comes walking down, cradling a rifle, and that was the end of that. Really freaked me out for a couple of months. I'm a believer in cryptozoology now. I don't know if Bigfoot exists, but something does that may be similar, especially considering most cultures have their monster. Normally, I get off work right around 10 p.m. This was at night when I saw this. I'm also going to leave my name out of this just in case it could hurt my law enforcement credential. I don't know what I saw, but it was some sort of canine. I was driving down an isolated road that leads to one house on the other side of the hill. I haven't seen any cars or people on this road. It's more of a way for me to get home quicker without having to go all the way around by using this nifty shortcut. But as I'm coming up the hill on my way home, something in the middle of the road catches my eye. Well, it was more so on the side of the road, trying to make its way towards the middle. Before I even had time to think about stopping or barely swerving, whatever it was was already up against my car with its front paws and claws up against the hood. This thing was huge. I slammed my gas pedal, hoping it would get out of the way, but I began hearing this little rumbling noise, like this dog growling at me. So, I got out of there fast. This thing went down and on all fours from two and was now running alongside my car for a little bit, before dropping back down behind me, disappearing into the darkness. Everything about this thing was huge. I can't get over it. It had massive legs and were just big. The entire body was big. Its head was huge. It had a very long snout and pointed ears. It looked kind of like a wolf, but different. The largest wolf I've ever seen. And those eyes, its eyes, were from a whole other world. They were bright red. Thanks for listening to my story. Feel free to share it if you'd like, as long as you keep my name out of it. I patrolled the vast expanse of Yellowstone National Park, a place of breathtaking beauty and tranquility. But lately, an eerie sense of foreboding had settled over the park, leaving everyone on edge. Reports of strange sightings and unsettling events flooded in, spreading like wildfire. Whispers of the Mothman had taken hold, fueled by stories shared on Reddit. As a park ranger named Ray, I prided myself on my rationality and level-headedness. I didn't easily succumb to stories of cryptids and supernatural beings. However, as the days went by and more sightings piled up, even my skepticism began to waver. The Mothman, according to the Reddit threads, was a winged creature associated with impending disasters. Its ominous presence often served as a harbinger of tragic events. I tried to dismiss it as nothing more than folklore, but the growing tension among the park staff hinted at a collective fear. One night, under the watchful gaze of a full moon, when I embarked on my usual patrol, the air crackled with an electric energy, and a thick fog enveloped the trees, lending an eerie atmosphere to the park. I glanced around, my senses on high alert. And then I saw it, a silhouette emerged from the darkness the unmistakable shape of a winged creature. Its eyes glowed with an otherworldly intensity. The Mothman adrenaline surged through my veins as I fumbled for my camera, desperate to capture evidence of this elusive creature. Before I could steady my trembling hands, the Mothman lunged at me. Its wings flapped with a thunderous roar, and I staggered backward, my heart pounding in my chest. It tackled me to the ground, but before I could react, it swiftly disentangled itself and took flight. Disappointment washed over me as I scrambled to my feet, my camera now a useless weight in my hands. I watched as the Mothman disappeared into the night, leaving me with a mixture of awe and frustration. The encounter had been brief, yet it confirmed the existence of this enigmatic cryptid. As the days turned into weeks, the park staff continued to report unusual occurrences. Mysterious accidents, unexplained phenomena, 
and an overwhelming sense of unease weighed heavily on our minds. The Mothman sightings had become more frequent, intensifying the sense of impending doom. I realized then that my skepticism had been shattered. The Mothman was no mere folklore. It was a part of Yellowstone's dark tapestry. I delved deeper into the Reddit thread, searching for answers, desperate to understand the cryptid's purpose and the impending disaster it seemed to foretell. In the end, despite my efforts, the catastrophic event that had been lurking on the horizon arrived. A violent earthquake shook the park, unleashing chaos and destruction. Buildings crumbled, trees splintered, and panic gripped both visitors and staff. As I surveyed the aftermath, I couldn't help but wonder if the Mothman had come to warn us, or if its presence had somehow triggered the calamity. The answers remained elusive, lost in the chaos that had engulfed Yellowstone. This happened about 15 years ago back in Mexico. Me and my dad, along with some friends, were out in the woods gathering firewood. A old dirt road used mainly by cattle and ranchers. No other traffic that far out. Ten minutes later, this nice new truck with tinted windows coming from the opposite direction stops maybe 25 feet in front of my dad's truck. We could hear somebody crying in the truck, most likely a woman, but I'm not sure. But me being like 10 didn't think much of it and continued to grab fallen branches. The truck just stopped, but no one got out of the vehicle. My dad told us that it was enough for the day, and it was getting dark. All the older guys in the group seemed to know something was up and jumped in the truck in a hurry. I even got my finger smashed on the door because of it, but again I didn't think much of it, aside from my finger getting bloodied. I remember my dad driving fast. They talked and murmured, but it was grown-ups talk to me, and... All I could think of was my finger and the pain. When we got back to the town, my dad pounded a few beers and they talked. Several years later, when I was in my early 20s, that memory came back and I connected the dots to what we witnessed. I never felt so much fear in my life before. To this date is the scariest thing that ever happened to me. I don't have the guts to bring it up to my dad, but I'm pretty sure that it was some sort of cartel-related deal. But for some reason, they decided that we didn't see anything. Also, this is because back in the day, and in my area, you never really heard of crime like that. The only crime was cartel on cartel super secretive crime. So I'm sure that whoever was inside probably had something to do with them, if it was cartel related. But I can only imagine what my dad felt having me and his friends with him there and seeing something that we were not supposed to see. It could have gone terribly wrong for all of us. I used to work at a weather station in northern Canada. It was a 24-hour place, so it was manned round the clock and often by someone who was awake. I worked nights many, many times, and I didn't see much creepy stuff, but heard a lot. Fairly nearby was a place where a couple of local guys housed their sled dog teams. You'd hear them yipping and barking now and then, and it was quite routine. Other times it was apparent that a bear or wolf was over there and bugging them in their cages because it was a lot more than normal barking. It was the sound of shit, scared dogs freaking out. I only heard this next thing happen one time, but pretty clearly something had gotten in there and killed at least one dog. I heard the sound of a living critter screaming while it was being killed, and it totally knew it. There's no other way to describe it. If you heard it, you'd know. I walked with cautious excitement through the old Comanche reservation. My name is Jose, a young Comanche Native American archaeologist deeply connected to the rich history and spiritual traditions of my people. Today I had stumbled upon a burial ground that had been concealed from us for centuries. As I brushed away the dirt and leaves, I uncovered ancient texts etched onto weathered stones. The symbol spoke of a forgotten era, 
revealing a harrowing tale of an unknown predator that had ravaged our ancestors 200 years earlier. The text spoke of its monstrous features, a beast with antlers, a snout, and six terrifying legs. The predator's insatiable appetite for blood left our people in fear and despair. Intrigued, I delved deeper into the mysterious history of our tribe. However, with every step, I couldn't shake the feeling that unseen eyes watched my every move. Strange occurrences surrounded me, the whispers of the wind carrying warnings that echoed through the trees. It wasn't long before I realized that the unknown predator described in the text was not just a relic of the past. It was real, and it was pursuing me relentlessly. Fear coursed through my veins as I witnessed its monstrous presence in deep woods while I was hunting its antlers piercing the night sky, and its six legs propelling it with unimaginable speed. Determined to protect my people and unveil the truth, I embarked on a perilous journey. Armed with knowledge and guided by the spirits of my ancestors, I sought to confront the predator head on. It was a battle of survival, a clash between human will and primordial terror. After many heart-stopping encounters, the ultimate twist revealed itself, a betrayal that cut me to my core. Our tribe leader, the one in whom I trusted and respected, had concealed dark secrets that were meant to stay buried. The predator, it turned out, was somehow linked to our own people's history, a curse that had been hidden for generations. With clarity, I understood that the responsibility to end this cycle of fear and betrayal fell upon my shoulders. Armed with my ancestral bow and arrows, I faced the predator in a final showdown. Adrenaline surged through my veins as I unleashed a barrage of arrows, each one finding its mark until the beast finally fell. As the life drained from its monstrous form, it vanished before my eyes, leaving behind only a lingering sense of victory mingled with sorrow. I had fulfilled my duty, but the wounds of betrayal ran deep within my soul. In the end, I emerged from this terrifying ordeal with a newfound strength and resilience. The burial ground, once shrouded in darkness, had now been exposed to the light. I vowed to protect my people and ensure that the sins of the past would never haunt us again, for it is through the wounds of betrayal that we learn the power of our own spirit and the strength to build a brighter future. I am a biologist, and one of the perks of the job is being able to see some remote and spectacular places that people don't see very often. Part of my work involves collecting insects from remote water holes out in the middle of Australia, a few hundred kilometers north of Uluru. One of the ladies I work with, Alice, lives out there full time, spends a lot of time out bush, and has spent a lot of time with the local aboriginal people, so she has a trove of stories and weird experiences. But I'll just tell you about the one I had. So as I said, I visit a lot of water holes out there. Being a very arid region, these water holes hold great spiritual and cultural significance to the indigenous people. Most, if not all of them, are sacred in some way, and they all have traditional stories attached to them. So one day, four of us headed out to this particular site, a full day of heavy four, wheel driving through the Fink Gorge. We get there not long before sundown, and as we pull up, there is a black dingo standing in the spot we are going to camp. He stares at us for a bit, then disappears off into the bush as they do. This in itself isn't weird. Plenty of dingoes out there, and they come in a range of colors. Not that common to see a black one, but they are around. So that's fine. We set up camp. Have a nice night of looking for pythons and drinking wine. Yep, biologists. We slept in swags, kind of like a tent that just fits a sleeping bag and sometimes has a little fold-up netting bit so you can sit up in there. It was really windy that night, so no problems with spooky noises, and I went to sleep pretty quickly. That night I had a really vivid dream about the black dingo coming into camp, sniffing around my swag and scratching at the netting trying to get in. 
It bothered me, and I woke up, but went back to sleep pretty soon after. Still not so weird. We woke up in the morning, did our sampling, packed up camp, and started off on the long drive back to town. After we have been driving for a bit, Alice starts talking about how seeing the black dingo at the campsite when we got there really freaked her out. She didn't say anything earlier because she didn't want us to be spooked. Turns out that in the traditional folklore, that water hole is protected by a black dingo spirit. The last time Alice camped there with other people, one of them had a dream that a black dingo came up to their swag and started attacking her. This lady woke up with long, deep scratches all over her face and no reasonable explanation for them. I had no idea of this story before I had the dream and didn't mention it to anyone that morning. There is definitely a special feeling to a lot of these places. Very hard to describe. When you're out in this country, these kinds of weird, semi-spiritual coincidences are commonplace. I have some more stories, but I'm typing on my phone and my thumbs are sore. Three teenage witnesses were playing basketball from 6 to 9 a.m. on a Saturday morning. The weather was clear and sunny and they were across the street from a fire station in Fairview, New Jersey. While walking back to a friend's home, the reporting witness noticed that the area was empty of cars and people when normally there would be 50 to 100 people in the park. The witness stated that he observed rainbow colors out of the corner of his right eye. When he looked, he saw a shining silver metallic saucer with round tinted windows. He alerted his two friends who also saw the craft. He heard and felt whirring air and a roaring sound. His shirt was flapping as if in a five mile an hour wind, but there was no wind. They were paralyzed and could not run. They later arrived back at his friend's home with no memory of walking there. The witness discussed the incident with two friends, both now deceased, and they had no memory of being on the craft as he did. He recalled seeing them on operating tables, but he was standing approximately 30 feet away. The craft appeared larger inside than outside, possibly 400 feet across. About 25 creatures, approximately 4 feet tall, were present, with about 10 to 15 around him, and the rest around his friends. The creatures were gray in color, with large round heads and large black eyes. The creatures were touching him all over. They were speaking telepathically and were surprised when they realized that he could hear them. His mother had previously told him that psychic abilities were common in their family, but he had never really believed it. He asked why they were there. His impression was that they were friendly and curious and meant no harm. He believed that they were trying to help his two friends who both had heart problems, and he believes that their lives may have been extended by the aid rendered on the craft. He remembers looking out the window and down onto the basketball court where they had been playing. He could see other beings moving about in long corridors. He remembers seeing the craft ascend after they had been returned. It moved up and to the right, then left, then up and away, leaving a rainbow colored trail behind. When he returned to his home, his mother said he seemed changed, and he replied, It's no big deal, Mom. Before this report, he had only confided this story to his two daughters because he did not feel that anyone would believe him. I wasn't alone. I was working on a shrimp boat that was out to sea. Unbeknownst to me, most of the coastal shrimpers just go out for the day. For reasons unknown to me, our captain took us way the F out there. I think he said something about trying out new shrimping grounds. Anyway, we were heading into a storm, turned out to be a Cat 2 hurricane, and the boat was rocking. We got our rescue here, eh, and waited for the inevitable. It never came, but none have slept that night. It was eerie passing through the eye, totally calm while everything else raged around us. We had all made our peace. The next morning we had either gone through it or we came back the way we came. Either way, we were on the edge of the storm. The captain was tired, so we took the day off. 
The first mate and I sat on the deck for a fair bit of the day watching the last of the hurricane and the start of a new storm. We thought we had this smaller storm beat. We lowered the boom masts again and braced for heavy seas. The first mate brought along a bunch of weed and taught me how to roll a joint in your hand and how to smoke it. By this time, it was getting late in the day and the storm was getting more energetic. Lots of thunder and lightning. We could see the reflective light and hear the thunder, so we knew it was at least ten miles out. The first mate, who was pretty stingy otherwise, rolled me a big old fat joint and told me to enjoy it. Of course I was in hog heaven. It never occurred to why this skin flint was sharing all this with me. He absolutely didn't have to, hadn't before, and wouldn't afterwards. At some point it dawns on me. So I ask why now and not last night when I was wholly terrified in a life vest and hive his ocean survival suit thing. He points off in the distance and I see a little itty bitty funnel cloud. Looks like a tornado. In the open water they're called water spouts and they're just as dangerous. So I get kind of worried. The first mate laughed and said look around. There were at least 13 water spouts within a few miles of us. The first mate wasn't watching the storms. He was watching these water spouts pop up every so often, getting a little closer each time. By now, the captain is awake, and we're booking it anywhere but where we were. By the time all was said and done, we had gotten passed by three different spouts, got a rain of sand dollars, jellyfish, and a load of other ocean goodies. We had one go directly over us and touched down ten yards from the deck. I was scared of the hurricane, but these salty dogs were totally and completely terrified of the water spouts. It was, and is by far, the creepiest thing that's ever happened to me. Noises in the woods being followed by a black bear are all upsetting, but for some reason being in that boat at that time got under my skin. I am in the army and while training in Hohenfels, Germany, our platoon was sitting on a screen line conducting an area reconnaissance mission. During the night, the guy on guard heard someone bang three times on the left side of the Bradley, which doesn't make sense because you would need another large metal object to make such a noise. Less than five seconds later, he heard the same three knocks on top of the turret. A few seconds pass and a high-pitched tone comes through the headset with three knocks on the back door of the Bradley along with someone screaming, Hey, let me in! This wakes me and one other up and we open the door, thinking it's someone in our platoon who is trying to get in touch with us. There was only complete darkness. We waited about 30 seconds. Geared up and checked a 15 semicircle around our Bradley, finding nothing. We get back inside and every fault light in the turret is on with some blinking. They don't blink ever. The radios were also completely dead. We restarted the turret and everything worked fine. Called over the net to see if anyone was near our area and no one was. Next day we asked the OOCs, essentially referees, and no one else was out the night prior. Shortly after, we discovered an old tank half buried and rusted out near our position. We came to the conclusion that it must have been ghost Nazis. This happened about six months ago. Bit of background, I've grown up on boats and beaches. Family have always had a boat and I have always fished. However, this story didn't happen when I was out in the ocean. I was at a friend's house just after the moon had risen. It was a fairly bright night as I was sitting with a group of friends on a beach house deck. Anyway, none of us had actually taken any drugs or started drinking yet. We had just gotten back to the house. I remember looking out at the view of the beach and the moon. The bright moon was shining a fairly wide path from just below it, across the water and onto the beach, but all the other water was dark. You can imagine it like this. Although you could see the occasional wave break as a white wash caught some light. Anyway, I noticed a red light going from left to right. This is strange because of starboard green. Light should have been showing on that side of any boat at a cracking pace. 
like it looked like some serious type of speedboat flying. I pointed this out to my friends, and a few of us noted how quick and smooth this boat was flying across the bay. It eventually moved near the light of the moon, and as we all watched it fly past it, it was literally just a red light, like a giant red ball. As soon as it hit the other side of the moonlight, it disappeared. I kind of assumed it was a drone, but it was seriously quick. It disappeared and was a long way out, skimming what looked very close to the water on a surf beach. If anyone actually got this far, thanks for reading. The names in the following account are changed to avoid criminal prosecution. Both I and the man who told me of the incident are holders of now inactive top-secret clearances issued by Department of the Navy Central Adjudication Facility. I don't know if the details of the incident are still classified. This is why I've changed the names. I apologize in advance for the cryptic nature of the story. However, I have known this man, I'll call him Jim, and served in combat with him for many years. I have and will stake my life on his integrity. People have been misled to believe that these are animals, so it's okay to kill them. Some time ago, Jim was sent on a tad temporary additional duty to a unit in Alaska. Most of the time, they were spent on field daying at this or that location, sitting around and passing scuttlebutt rumors about the nature of their purpose there. The official title is simply Security Force Training was conducted on Target Acquisition Field Navigation and Winter Survival Alert. Drills were called almost daily. Jim and his platoon responded to the alert as always. Only this time the truck they had boarded started pulling out. He said they rode from 15 to 20 minutes to get up there in the middle of a huge valley at which point they were told to follow an officer and a civilian guide. He and the others walked quickly at first for about a mile and then were told to be quiet. They're also told to check their weapons. Standard M16s of fours and one guy had an M40 and a 762 by 50 one millimeter bolt action rifle. They were told they were there to kill an animal that was a threat to the compound and local residences. Jim told me that he had been on edge until that point because he didn't know what they were up against, but that a hunt for a bear or something was a relief. They spread out in a skirmish line and moved forward slowly and quietly with the guide about 20 yards in front of them. They had advanced that way about 150 yards when the guide stopped. They were just inside a tree line on the edge of a large meadow. As the line got to the guide, Jim said he saw what looked like a dark brown bear about another 50 yards into the meadow. The officer pointed to the bear and indicated that there was their target at that point. He and the others cycled the bolts on the rifles and took aim. That's when the bear stood up. Only it wasn't a bear. He said it was about six feet tall with wide flat shoulders, not the sloping shoulders of a bear, and the legs were too long to be a bear. Its head was humped, and it had a long, and it had long arms that turned its head and looked at them. No one fired a shot. The thing grabbed something off the ground and started running away. That's when he saw the second one, smaller, in his words, about maybe four or five feet tall following the big one. They were quick, too. The officer in charge hollered shut, and we opened fire. The first to go down was a smaller one. The big one stopped while still under fire and went back to the small one, dropped to a knee, and let out what Jim described as the cry of a mother over her dying child. I saw the hair on his arm stand up when he said, I kid you not. The rest of the story was told to me with his head down, unable to look me in the eyes. We stopped firing when the mother cried out, but the officer ordered us to kill it, so we resumed fire. The mother refused to leave the down child and took what he said was around 90 to 100 more rounds and she finally went down. No one moved forward, but they stopped firing and reloaded. He said, we held our position for, I don't know, about 10 or so more minutes. That's when the officer started to walk toward it. The guy told him to stay there, wait and give us some time to be sure it was dead. About an hour passed with no one talking. He said we couldn't even look at each other. 
My gut was churning the whole time, and I wanted to throw up. Finally, the guide and the officer walked to the bodies and confirmed the kill. The rest of the platoon were not allowed to view the bodies, but were ordered back to the truck. On the way back to the compound, he saw other military vehicles heading toward the site, but they weren't from his compound. He said, I don't know where they came from. I mean, we were the only military in the area. Upon returning to the compound, he and the rest of the platoon were debriefed one by one and told not to talk to anyone about the mission under threat of a life sentence in Leavenworth. Both Jim and I are retired, and both our wives have passed, so we don't have much to lose. It took a couple of shots of Jack, Daniels, and some other war stories to get to this one, but I swear every word is true. Jim doesn't lie, and neither do I, and I'll have words with any man who says this didn't happen. People need to know these are not animals. They are just as human as you or me. I don't know how they came to be, and I don't care. I just want people to know. I woke up to the sound of footsteps outside my bedroom door. My heart was pounding as I tried to listen carefully. The footsteps seemed to be getting closer. I was paralyzed with fear, wondering who could be walking around my house at this time of night. I quietly slipped out of bed and peered through my bedroom door, trying to catch a glimpse of whoever or whatever was walking around my house. But the darkness was too thick, and I couldn't see anything. Suddenly I heard a loud creaking noise, and I realized that someone was opening the door to my bedroom. I didn't know what to do. Should I run or confront the person? But as the door opened, I saw nobody there. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up, and my heart was racing even faster than before. I slowly walked towards the door, trying to be as quiet as possible. My hands were shaking, and my mind was racing with fear and confusion. Was this a dream, or was someone really in my house? As I stepped out of my room, I could hear a strange noise like a soft whisper coming from the darkness. It sounded like someone was breathing heavily right outside my door. My heart was pounding so hard that I couldn't think straight. I stumbled backwards and ended up falling down the stairs. I felt myself tumbling downwards, seemingly in slow motion, until I hit the bottom with a loud thud. I looked up to see a shadowy figure standing over me, and my heart stopped. I couldn't move or scream. The figure slowly started to take shape, revealing itself to be a person, but their face was completely covered. I couldn't see who it was, but I knew I was in danger. I tried to crawl away, but the figure caught up to me and reached out, grabbing me by the hair. I screamed in terror, but no sound came out. I felt like I was drowning in my own fear as the figure slowly dragged me towards my bedroom. That was the last thing I remembered before waking up in the hospital. The doctors told me that I'd suffered a concussion, but I couldn't help thinking about who or what had come into my house that night. The memory of those footsteps, the whispers in the darkness, and the figure that had haunted my nightmares ever since has never left me. To this day, I still wonder what could be lurking in the shadows of my home, waiting to strike again. First time hunting. About six years ago, in my early twenties, I was with two friends from high school that I hadn't seen in a few years. One of the guys, say his name is Freddy, had gone silent on me and my other friend, let's say Jacob. Freddy came back into town and went drinking with Jacob. Jacob calls me, saying Freddy is back and wants to go camping. Turns into hunting pretty quick. Here's the weird part. Freddy had this unmistakable scar over his eye like he'd been in a fight with a guy and like the movies. The knife was pressed down. I'd asked Jacob and he hadn't checked as to why. But we found out pretty quick the guy was nuts, so who knows? Freddy says he remembered hunting there with his dad. Mind you, we were supposed to be camping. He said the location was just up the way. A few shots of tequila and about five more just up the ways and Freddy stops. He looks back. I realize it's twilight and darkness is falling on us fast. Freddy, Jacob, I think this is where it happened. Jacob looks back at me bewildered. Jacob, 
What's that man, Freddy? Where it almost killed me. About that time, the tequila buzz amped up, and I laughed out loud. Turns out Freddy didn't like this and took off running. We try to catch up, but he's like gone, gone. So drunk Jacob and I had to pop open our easy set-up tent and stay the night in bumfuck Montana. Jacob and I start talking about Freddy, his history, the I, and where the F he went to. Throughout the night, we heard what we thought for sure was him. Same cough and all. We start laughing about old times and must have passed out. I hear a zipper and see a dim light through the film of the tent. It's Freddy. Hey guys, get the fuck. I'm freaking out. Buzz had worn off, but Jacob and I were totally confused. Freddy. My friend Sam doesn't believe me when I tell him I got friends. Or something to that effect. Sam turned out to be a deep woodsman from the backcountry. A true hillbilly hick in every sense. Dude smelled like compost, and I couldn't see much of him, just silhouette. Jacob pulls a gun and tells them to F off. We get out, leaving everything behind. I was still a bit too drunk to process what happened. The sun comes up, and we hit the main road again after what was probably two hours of walking. I sober up completely, and Jacob tells me something that I still remember. He said he never drank the tequila. Only I did, and that when I started rambling all weird, he knew Freddy had slipped us something. Freddy never had a friend with him. Turns out I hallucinated it. I guess he had slipped me something that made me hallucinate all the conversations and everything. The one accurate part I got right was Freddy had taken off running, but it wasn't long. He came back telling Jacob he let us out there to hunt us and wanted us to run. Jacob pulled his gun. He had packed against my wishes and freaked old Freddy out and he ran off for good. It was a rough end to what was a decent friendship in school. No telling what his scar was from and what happened to him, but we clearly lost all contact and I bought Jacob a real shot of tequila after we got back into town the next weekend. He saved me. The kicker was he didn't even have any bullets in the gun. He said he forgot to load it. Still freaks me out. A few years ago, my wife and I were living near Laneville, Texas, which is located in Rusk County on farm to market route 225. My wife loves gardens and we always had a chicken pen. Our adult children enjoy the garden produce and the fresh eggs from our hens. We lived this way for many years after we moved there in 1981. We had no intention of ever going back to the big city. The incident that I'm writing about happened in 2015, and it signaled the end of our chicken business. Each morning, I have to walk down to the chicken pen that was 150 feet behind our house. After I fed the chickens and checked their water, I headed back to the house to eat breakfast. I had guns, but I never carried one around our own property. At that time, we had a terrier who went everywhere we did. She had never shown any inclination to be afraid of anything. But on this day, I was in the middle of my chores, when the terrier stopped dead still. She was fixed on something beyond the tree line behind the chicken pen, and the hair on her neck and back stood straight up. She was frozen in place and didn't move a single muscle. I shifted my gaze to the tree line, and what I saw caught my breath. I knew I was looking at something I had never seen before. This thing apparently had been walking just outside the tree line, and it stopped when we did. It seemed to be the size of a wolf. Its head was light gray, and there wasn't a single hair on its body. Its rear legs made it appear as though it could easily walk on all fours or stand upright like a man. The tail was the same length as its body, and from where I stood, it looked like a dog until it turned revealing a head that looked more like a feline than a canine. With similar short pointed ears, the eyes were something unworldly. They were bright blue and bored into us for about 15 seconds, showing no sign of fear. It then turned and walked to the woods and out of sight. I tried to make sense of what I had just witnessed as I hurried and tossed the chicken feed into the pen. I realized that the terrier had already hightailed it back to the house ahead of me. 
Over breakfast, I told my wife about the encounter, and from that day onward, the terrier would not go near the chicken pen unless she was with me. Even then, she stayed behind me, always watching the woods. I did, too. It's strange how random things can suddenly make sense once you see a connection. A few weeks later, a feral dog got into the pen and was trying to kill a chicken. I was going to gather eggs, and ever since the strange encounter that day, I had begun carrying a rifle with me. I shot the dog, got a shovel, and dug a hole behind the pen. The feral dog was the size of a large collie and must have weighed 80 or so pounds. I had to drag the carcass to the hole and roll it in. After burying the dog and securing the pen, I went back to the house, and that was the end of it, or so we thought. Two days later, while feeding the chickens, I noticed something odd behind the pen. I walked around to take a look. What I found was a hole two feet across, right where I had buried the dead dog, and the carcass was gone. There were no drag marks or whatever it was. It was big enough to pull the body up out of the dirt and carry it off without leaving a trail. I searched all over the back of our property and never found anything that would suggest some sort of scavenger was at work. My wife and I were the only ones who knew what I had buried back there. The next morning, when I went to feed the chickens, it looked like a crime scene. They were all dead, and their headless remains were scattered about the pen. The rooster had been tossed twenty feet from the ground into the top of a persimmon tree. Oddly enough, given the scale of the carnage, there was not a single drop of blood anywhere. The gate was latched, and there was no hole in the fence or signs of something that gained entry by digging under the fence. But the killer had left some evidence behind. There were footprints and deep gouges made by three long claws that were estimated to be two and a half inches long. I drove over to my neighbor's house and asked him to have a look at the tracks. He was a hunter who was born and raised in the area, but even he was stumped. He suggested we call a friend of his who was a constable and another longtime resident. He looked at the tracks and examined the dead chickens. After he noticed the dead rooster dangling in the tree, he warned us not to go out at night without a gun. We decided not to replace the chickens. Not long after that incident, we moved to another location. We just didn't want to cross paths with whatever was lurking around the property. I live in Michigan and regularly go out trapping or coyote hunting. One day I'm taking a longtime friend hunting for the first time. He lived out of state so he wasn't familiar with the area and its types of people and habits, so to speak. Anyways, we were walking along and, unfortunately, the coyote spot I usually used had now been useless after so many uses of traps and shots taken. So we went a bit deeper to look for a better spot. The coyotes had a den and some lowlands and thick brush. I don't usually go out there, but I didn't want my friend's first hunt to be a boring one, so we pressed on. After a bit of walking, my friend noticed a blood trail, and I assumed another hunter hit and wounded one. I figured we would track to make sure it didn't suffer, so we followed the blood trail. The strange part was we didn't notice any tracks, and it was winter, so tracks would be easy as they to spot. However, when we reached the source, we ended up finding something a lot more gruesome. We came across the dead bodies of a man and woman. The man had a crossbow bolt in his stomach and looked like he had been stabbed. The woman was stabbed much worse and looked like she had been, quote, sexually used. Needless to say, we called the police. I've never been back to those woods since, and now when I got out, I wear body armor underneath my vest and always go with a partner. I'm always going to go back to the forest, and this isn't a hunting story. But here's one unknown thing that really freaked me out. I was hiking the highest peak in Utah with a small group over one-fourth of July weekend, and we had to backpack in about 12 miles to where we would set up camp. One of the guys in our group owned two pack llamas and brought them along to carry some stuff. The owner said that llamas are very territorial and will make a high-pitched gobbling sound if they feel threatened. I thought that was weird and didn't really believe him. 
On the second night after summiting the peak, I had a crazy headache and wasn't getting any sleep in my tiny single-person tent. I'd been laying there for hours after everyone else had gone to bed, and it was late into the night when I started hearing gobbling from the llamas in our camp. Sitting alone in a tent with no protection and not knowing what is looming around my campsite did not make for a fun night, and that was the last time I slept in a tent. In the morning, everyone said they were asleep and did not hear anything. God, I really want to tell this to people. So a few months ago, my girlfriend and I went to a public state park. It is not like a middle of nowhere, but still not many people around, and it was in the afternoon that a strange thing happened. When we were heading out of the park, we saw a car that was traveling on the opposite side toward us. Then the car turned right. It was a sedan. We thought there was a road right there. And when we got to the section where that car turned, we didn't see any road, but only high grass and big trees. I asked my girlfriend, did you see that red car just now? I thought it turned right around here. She said, I saw a car too, but it was white, wasn't it? We looked at each other's for a few seconds and quickly left that area. That was weird. I was working as a forest ranger up here in Anchorage when this happened. My job at the time was to patrol the remote areas of the park, make sure nobody ever lit fires they weren't supposed to or throw litter when they weren't supposed to. I was equipped with my own radio and rifle with me at all times in case I had to deal with any squatters or crazy people who came in the woods looking to do bad things or maybe camping out at night illegally when they weren't supposed to. It was just before midnight on a Friday evening. I had been patrolling an area called Barney Creek. I hadn't noticed anything unusual happening, so I wasn't expecting anything like that later that night. But then, I found a deceased person, a skeleton. More on that in just a second. On my way back to my car is when I saw this body lying across the trail that I'd been walking on. At first, I thought it was maybe an animal due to the condition that the body was in. But as I got closer and looked again, I realized it wasn't a bear corpse or any other animal because there was no fur covering its flesh. It had obviously died quite a while ago. After shining my flashlight around the area more thoroughly, with a sense of growing apprehension tapping into whatever bravery might be needed, I slowly approached the remains took out my camera before beginning to take pictures of the evidence. I was in no way prepared for what I saw when I moved much closer to take a look. The skull was pretty badly rotted, and there appeared to be a bullet hole right behind the left eye socket. Some brutal execution must have also happened, maybe even torture, judging by how bony and ripped out their chest area looked without flesh or what was left covering up the rib cage. Whoever they were, somebody wanted them dead and couldn't accept any opposition from whoever they were going after. This meant that whoever killed them was still around, and they'd be coming back. They could have been waiting out for me in the forest, possibly planning to take out their sick revenge on me. I had one mission, to get out of there as soon as possible and alert the authorities for backup. I had to run back as fast as I could, which was hard with how freaked out and terrified I was. Still getting lost and occasionally trying to remember every time a branch or leaf would brush against me, I just suspected it was something that could kill me now, kind of like a monster's claw reaching up from behind bushes, ready to grab me by the neck and snap it like a twig. My heart raced with so much fear that I swear it was almost going to pop out of my chest without any warning at all. Finally, after what seemed like forever, I managed then to get away, but just collapsed onto the forest floor, completely exhausted. As soon as morning had arrived, I was successful in returning to the area, but the remains were gone. I couldn't tell if somebody had come in and taken them, or maybe some animal decided to bury their body under some dirt or leaves until fully decomposed. In any case, it didn't matter much because no one was going to find out who killed that person. But I realized afterwards whoever did it might have been looking for me too. 
It's best not to say anything about my experience now while I'm still working as a ranger. Look, I don't know what happened, but here in Alaska at night, those skeletal remains still haunt me. I've never seen a cadaver in that bad condition. But all I can say is, why didn't everybody just stay away from this area? Why did this happen? Who's this poor soul that got killed? It definitely looked malicious, like somebody had just left the body there. I mean, that's kind of obvious. Had it been an animal, it would have been eaten or torn apart. But the body had been there for a while, and there were no signs of any animals even touching it. How strange, almost paranormal, if you will. I've received many strange, bizarre calls as an officer. This is one of them. The call came in as a woman reporting to the police that she had heard and seen a large dog trying to break into her home. She sounded frantic. It told me she saw the creature trying to get in through her door several times before dialing 911. The dispatcher asked if the animal was actually inside her home. She told us no. The dispatcher asked if this thing was trying to get inside her house. She said yes and told the dispatcher that this was a large, vicious dog, larger than any dog she'd ever seen before. This continued on for several minutes until I finally arrived on the scene. I got out of my car and walked towards the house, flashlight in hand and ready for anything. Then I knocked on the front door. I waited several seconds and there was no response. I knocked again, still nothing. So I walked around the back of her home to see if she had gotten out another exit or entrance. I didn't want to break down her door. Maybe she wasn't in danger after all. About halfway up the driveway at the side of her house, I noticed a large missing section of fence that looked to be torn down, leading right off to the woods in the property next door. Then it occurred to me there were also large canine tracks that led over this fence, right in the dirt leading up to the house. As I crouched down, shined my flashlight, and began trying to investigate, I saw something that will haunt me forever. Growling at me from less than 20 feet away was a snarling wolf-like creature standing on two legs right by the tree line leading off into the woods. This creature lowered its head and growled and then jumped off quickly into the darkness of the forest. I had my gun drawn and ready, and as this thing disappeared and I kept my gun focused, two men appeared on the property whom I did not recognize. They were not fellow officers. They told me they were related to the woman inside. They both had firearms drawn but kept them by their side. I asked them if they knew what was going on. They both looked at me like I had two heads. The one guy said, you don't know. The second man just nodded toward the creature, whispering something. He began to tell me that this home is being attacked by a strange creature, the same creature that also attacked his daughter while he was trying to get her home from school just weeks ago. They were kind of like an unofficial band of men who were trying to track down this creature. He also informed me they had been tracking this beast for weeks after it killed several livestock in another rural area. I began to inform him about animal control, but he said that they had already done so, and they did not believe us. And then he showed me photos of his wife's injuries after this beast tried to kill her in cold blood. That photo will stay with me. His photo was of his wife laying on an emergency room table, fresh stitches all across her right side, face and neck, and also needing her jaw wired shut due to nearly being bitten off by this thing. Immediately, both men's attention went right towards the woods where this creature disappeared, both drawing the firearm. The one man with the photo began shooting several times, and just then we could hear the growling, and just there, faintly beyond the light of the house in the darkness, was this creature again. I've been trying to figure out what I was looking at. Werewolves aren't real. What else could this thing be if it's not a werewolf? Was this thing possibly some kind of mutation or maybe some sort of lab experiment? I don't know, but it kind of vanished again in the woods and things seemed to calm down that night. I took the names and members of the two gentlemen who seemed to want to help and let me know if there's anything I could share with them to help track down this strange creature. The woman inside the house refused to speak to me or even come out and acknowledge my presence. 
I think she was so frightened by what had just happened. Personally, I have no explanations for any of this. I just know that it was a very, very strange call and a very strange night. I was hunting down in Stephenville, Texas, during whitetail season. I was up in a tripod overlooking a pasture. Behind me, about 50 yards away, was a dry riverbed, but you couldn't see it because a dense screen of trees grew along both sides of the riverbed, but you could hike to it, and there was another spot I would sometimes hunt on the other side. It was getting late, but there was still a decent amount of light. I had seen absolutely nothing that day, not even critters. So I'm sitting up in my tripod just watching when all of a sudden from behind me in or around the riverbed, I hear the most ungodly shriek, howl, roar that made my hair stand on end, and I damn well near peed my pants. It continued for about three minutes until it suddenly stopped, and that's about when I decided to call it a night, ran the whole way back to my vehicle. I didn't see it, and I, to this day I still wonder what it was didn't sound like a bobcat or coyote, and Stephenville isn't exactly known for its big cats or any cryptids. Maybe some of you hunters out there have experienced something similar. I had horses out in the pasture. My two brothers, my sister, and I think one of the boy's friends went out to see the horses. We had 80 acres which butted up to logging property and wilderness. The river was across the dirt road from our property. We went out all the time in the dark. It didn't bother us at all. I rode my horse all over the hills and was never afraid. Well, anyway, we went out to find the horses and I had a flashlight. I was shining in the field looking for them. I headed at chest height sweeping the field. When I shone it back across the flat part of the field towards the river, I saw two orange glowing eyes looking at me. I didn't hear anything at all. It didn't move. There are no trees in that part of the field, and whatever it was, was taller than me. I have never been so afraid in my life. All the hair stood up on my body, and I felt weak. Never have I felt that way, and I have been in the woods all my life. I knew whatever it was. I was not supposed to be there. As I watched the strange thing was it closed its left eye and turned its head to the right. This was strange to me because I thought an animal would just turn its head out of the light, and that would mean its right eye would leave you first. Anyway, I still did not hear anything as I turned around and started running for the house. I tried to get everyone in, but they would not come all the way into the house. I, on the other hand, did not go out at night again for a long time. Another time when we were hunting in, say, 2004 around Green Peter, I was walking behind my husband, and, and in the mud, I saw a track. I stopped him, looked at it, and looked again. I was kind of embarrassed to say anything, but I know in my heart it was a Bigfoot track. It had all the toes, and the big toe was prominent. The back was kind of messed up because it was on a slope, but I know it was one. I wish I would have taken a picture of it. I wish I had not been embarrassed to say anything. My husband's family was camping in a houseboat on Lake Shasta when he was young. Him and his grandpa got up early to fish, and they looked up on a hill in a clear cut and saw a black thing stand up and walk across the clear cut. Both my husband and his grandpa recall it. I don't know the year, but it must have been about 26 years ago. His grandpa told me the story and swears it was not a bear. Well, I hope I see another one. I hope it is not up close, but I want to prove to myself that it is real. I'm in the Navy, and about 12 years ago, I was standing watch in a submarine engine room. We were underway, can't for the life of me remember where to, from, or just making circles. It was the mid-watch, and I sat down to catch up on some logs. That's when I heard a woman's voice and felt the hairs on my neck stand straight up. No women on subs then. I got up, looked around, and found the other watches shooting the shed or doing their daily tasks. I thought maybe I'd dozed off and dreamt it. 
I sat back down and heard it again, and it sounded like it was coming from outside the hatch I was sitting under. I said to this shit out loud and went to just be around the other guys on watch. I still get chills thinking about it, even now. My husband, now ex, and I were hiking cross, country in Oregon, mostly following a creek bed that didn't seem to be used much, if at all, by other hikers. When we came around a bend in the creek, we saw something that seemed quite tall. Maybe as tall as a moose, but not a moose. At first, I thought it was a bear standing up, but it was moving away from us, going in the same direction as us, across a rocky creek meadow that had opened up suddenly, and that also had several boulders strewn about. It looked over its shoulder briefly during one of its strides, like a nonchalant or natural action, not a craning of the neck or anything, and continued on. It was almost like its head automatically turned slightly in the direction of the back swinging arm. It seemed I could make out arms swinging, but I admit my mind was whirling. It was not a moose. The face was flat. There was no rack or anything animal looking about it. It then turned away from the creek bed and went up the mountainside. Although I got the impression that this was not a last minute panic decision because of us, just that it was continuing on its original planned course, very leisurely looking. It mostly went straight up, very easily and just barely cutting across the natural slope. Either this thing had been right in front of us for a while, moving along the same creek bed, or we caught it just having come off the mountain, or just having started to move off at that point. It seemed more like it had been ahead of us the whole time, which was a creepy feeling. Anyway, I had not been looking for any footprints. I'm a rock hunter and had no belief or interest in Bigfoot at that time. Details of location and terrain are few, but I have seen elk, moose, buffalo, and grizzly bear in various other treks. This seemed, at first glance and without much to use for scale, to be much larger than any of those and appeared to be on two legs, taller than it was long or wide, I only got glimpses of it as it went around boulders, trees, etc., and I did not attempt to get closer. We immediately headed back the way we came and spent one uneasy night in the wilderness before getting back to our car, probably about a six-hour hike in. I do know I forced my husband to put as much distance as possible between us and the thing that night. I even forced us to go on in the dark using flashlights. As slow going as it was, jumping at every cracking tree limb and every rustle of a bush. That's it, except for the one other thing I did notice before I turned and scurried away, practically knocking over my husband in my desire to run. I grew up in a house where my backyard was a huge forest in rural Illinois. When I was a kid, I loved being outdoors and would take every possible opportunity to run amok in the woods with my best friend. When we were younger, uh, 11, 12, we stayed closer to the house on the outskirts and climbed the trees. As we got older, 13, 15, we would venture deep, walking and swimming in the rivers and building little forts. When I was 16, the forest was roped off and closed off to the public as a company had began illegally dumping lead or mercury into the woods. But that's another story. It was the middle of a hot summer, and I was about 15 at the time. Dusk was approaching, and my friend had to go home for dinner, but I wasn't quite ready to leave. We parted ways, and I climbed up a tree near my favorite spot over the river. Now these woods backed up to a local gun club, so it wasn't uncommon to hear shooting. However, this gun club was contained in its own private property, and the members never ventured out into the forest. I sat in my tree for a little bit and ate the blackberries I'd picked earlier while watching it get darker when I suddenly spotted movement out of the corner of my eye. At first, I assumed it was a younger deer because it was larger, but not huge, but I quickly realized it was a man. He seemed to be in his late thirties or early forties, and he wore a black t-shirt and camo pants with creepy, wiry facial hair. He was skulking, 
like he didn't want to be seen. I thought this was odd, but had no intention of making my presence known since something felt wrong in being a 15-year-old girl alone in the woods. I knew I was at a disadvantage. I slowed my breath down and watched. At first, he didn't say anything as he walked around the base of the trees. It was around that time that I realized he had a gun slung over his back. Once he got near the river where my friend and I had been loudly goofing off maybe ten minutes earlier, he started calling out, Hey, anyone here? Help? While grabbing his rifle, when there was no response and no noise, he gave up after a few minutes and began walking downstream. I waited until it was pitch black before sliding out of that tree as quietly as I could, running home and having my parents call the cops. They never found anything. I could never bring myself to go back. I had been working as a forest ranger for almost five years. A ranger's day could consist of anything from collecting firewood to tracking down missing hikers. And my day began like most. I would wake up early, walking into work and grabbing my binoculars. As I was about to drive out of the forest, I got a call. That day, I was given a new assignment. I met up with another colleague, a fellow ranger, and we went to the center of this area where somebody had been reporting hearing strange screaming coming from around a cave system nearby. My partner and I decided that I would be able to handle it by myself. He had other things to do, and this was just another run of the mill investigation for me. After he left, I headed towards that area where there had been several unreported mounds to this cave system. Now let me give you some information. This cave system runs pretty deep and there are guided tours. But I also know that this cave system is very expansive and also has a lot of unidentified entrances and holes that can lead deeper into the system. These are also off trails, so myself, I've never actually experienced finding more of these, although I know hikers have reported finding many and even leaving makeshift markers to let other hikers know this was an entrance. The parts of the ground here were also dangerous, meaning if you step on the wrong part, the ground below, you could collapse, falling into a tunnel. So, I had to be very careful about how I approached this entire search. The good news is I wasn't hearing any screaming, so that could be good or bad news. The bad news, meaning the hiker, whoever was stuck there, could have been deceased or what. But the good news being that maybe the hiker had gotten themselves out. Anyway, my heart was pounding just by the sheer adrenaline of it. I didn't know why, but something told me to run. It was this feeling in the pit of my gut. As soon as I got there, right around the cavern system, the wind picked up and everything seemed colder than it already was. A gust. Now I could have begun my investigation in the main entrance, but as I was planning, I heard the scream. It sounded like a person, but they were maybe a couple hundred feet away, north. So I marched through the trees, looking, following the source of the screaming, yelling out, Can you hear me? Can you respond? And the screaming ceased. I followed along the rock wall and found this crude hole in the ground, maybe no larger than five feet. It was right by a rotted tree stump with only one branch on it. This, I knew, probably went down into one of the cave systems. This, by the way, was probably no more than 200 feet away from the main entrance. After crouching down, I was able to slide down at a 45-degree angle into this cave system, landing in a small chamber that I think connected to the others. I always carry a flashlight with me, so I took it out and turned it on. As soon as I did that, the caves plunged into darkness as my battery instantly died. That's when I heard a loud crash. I turned around, or I should say, turned to meet the noise, and my flashlight popped back on. There, like out of some sort of sick Stephen King novel, was this grotesque figure. Large black eyes covering its entire body, stretching its arms out and moving toward me. Terrified, I wanted to turn and run, but didn't have time, as there was another one of these beings coming from the opposite side of the cave, approaching. I turned as fast as I could and fled up the 45-degree incline about the cave. 
Just as I was turning to clam up, I could hear a third one approaching from directly behind me. Now I had one coming from my left, my right, and behind me. This one, as I turned and looked, was larger than the other two. Completely terrified out of my mind, and the sounds of screaming were now apparent coming deeper in the cavern. I don't know if it was an injured hiker or if these things were making the noise, luring anybody into this tiny crevice, this chamber into the earth. Like I said, the opening to this cavern wasn't large, but I never in a million years would have expected to find things like this. This was horror movie status. I didn't tell anybody else about what I found and kept it to myself. After climbing out of that hole, I ran and ran and ran some more getting back to the station later on. I didn't say a word, and I knew the other rangers wouldn't believe me. And what would I tell them? That I found a cave full of half-arachnids, half-creatures. I mean, they'd probably think I was crazy. Now, I've kept this sacred for a while, but how long can I keep it from the rest of the world? Will my story ever be told to other people? Or should I just stay quiet about what had happened? Let me just apologize and say I'm sorry for the formatting of the story. I'm a terrible writer and I am not a storyteller, so I apologize in advance. But these creatures that I saw were unlike anything I've ever seen. They really reminded me if you crossed a tarantula with a human. I mean, these were gross. They made this hissing, clicking noise, too. I know it sounds phony through email, but... It's really hard for me to convey emotion properly, at least through written communication. With all the information coming out anymore about missing hikers and seeing strange figures and shapes in the woods and all the other bizarre happenings of 2020, I figured, hey, maybe now is an okay time to be open about my experiences and hopefully not experience backlash. My name is Officer T. Williamson, and I'm currently an officer in a small town east of Phoenix, Arizona. My encounter involves an online report that I had read from a man who goes by the name of Ken. The report detailed how he and his family have been being harassed by what they believe to be a demon for almost three years now. Mr. Ken begins the report by describing the very first encounter he had with this evil entity, which occurred back in the fall of 2013 at their home in Arizona. While nobody else was around except for his wife, who at the time was taking a shower, he explains that out of nowhere he hears her scream from upstairs. So he runs up there to see what's wrong only to find her standing there frozen with terror written all over her face, staring into the nothingness. When he asked her what was wrong, she described a tall, dark figure standing in the corner of their bedroom right outside of their bathroom door. Mr. Ken claims that when he looked in the same corner, all he saw was a pitch-black void where the figure had been standing, which caused this intense feeling of dread to come over him, made him feel as if death were staring him into his very soul. He told his wife there's nothing there, let her out of the bathroom for fear of her safety. After she clearly voiced concern about going back into the room, and with it still being very present, she had a hard time even going back in there, just turning off the shower. Ken then explains how throughout the next three years, this entity would go on to harass the family, manifesting in just about a different form every night. Whether it be the same dark figure, or sometimes this evil-looking gnome creature with red eyes, and another time he claims it appeared as a spirit made of pure fire. He said that although nothing ever physically happened to anybody within the house, everyone has experienced scratch marks, cuts, bruising all over their bodies for no real reason at all, all happening at separate times. Ken, too, claims that whatever this thing is loves to stand outside the bathroom door while people are showering and appears to be immune to things like crosses or crucifixes or even holy water. Going deeper into the report that I read, it didn't go into too much more detail about this entity. But from what Ken did say, it sounded like this was a type of spirit that takes the form it believes will frighten its victim the most, a shape shifting spirit. 
That being said, if Ken's family has been dealing with one for almost three years, I would say they have done very well in keeping whatever this thing was harassing them away from harming anybody. I'm not sure why this thing chose to show itself now after all these years, but maybe something happened recently to make it think attacking them might be possible. It also makes me wonder whether or not whoever wrote this report actually recorded everything their demon did throughout all the years and left that stuff out when writing about it just in case anybody reading it decided to call them out on their story. I don't think what Kennan has been experiencing was either a demon or a Bogart, but an entity that he... His family unintentionally invoked by possibly playing around with some kind of occult paraphernalia, which caused a ritualistic nightmare spirit to cross over from the spirit realm into their home, which they then failed to send back. If this really did go on for three years straight, I would say whatever is going on with their house definitely falls under the paranormal category instead of something rational. Like waking up at night and scratching yourself with your eyes still closed because you were dreaming about scratching yourself when, in reality, you're just moving around in your sleep due to maybe a medical condition or maybe even suffering from sleep paralysis. Sometimes you just have to take people who claim they are being harassed by something invisible with a grain of salt. I mean, even if it is real, they're might just be some sort of logical explanation of what's going on that they possibly haven't thought of yet. I've driven the highways of this country for longer than I can remember, and I've seen my share of strange things on the road. So it was a lonely road, the kind where the only company you have is the hum of the engine, and the soft glow of your dashboard lights. The radio had been nothing but static for hours, and my eyelids were growing heavy with exhaustion. That's when I saw him, a hitchhiker standing by the side of the road, thumb outstretched, a silhouette in the darkness. At first, he seemed like any other weary traveler looking for a lift. He was dressed in worn-out jeans and a faded flannel shirt, a backpack slung over one shoulder. I pulled my rig to a stop and rolled down the window. Need a ride? I asked, my voice echoing in the silence. He nodded a grateful smile on his face and climbed into the cab. I could see his face now, a young man with tousled hair and tired eyes. He didn't say much and I didn't press. I knew how it could be on the road. Sometimes you just needed someone to share the journey. As the miles passed, I couldn't help but feel something was off. He was too quiet, too still. It was as if he was a shadow, a ghost of a person, just there but not really. I tried to shake off the unease that settled in my chest, blaming it on the fatigue that had been gnawing at me. Then, as we rounded a bend in the road, a pack of creatures emerged from the darkness. They looked like nothing I'd ever seen before. Half man, half dog, with matted fur, snarling muzzles, and glowing, malevolent eyes. They blocked the road ahead, their growls and barks echoing in the night. I slammed on the brakes, my heart racing as I fumbled for my phone, thinking I had to call for help. But before I could even dial, the creatures lunged at the truck, clawing at the metal and snarling with ferocious hunger. Panic surged through me. Desperate, I turned to the hitchhiker, my voice trembling. What are these things? What do we do? But when I looked at him, I froze in terror. His face had changed, morphing into something twisted and ghastly. His eyes were hollow voids, and his skin was translucent like a ghost's. He reached out a hand, and it passed right through mine. With a cold, eerie smile, he whispered, I'm sorry. Before I could react, he vanished, leaving me alone in the cab with those nightmarish creatures clawing at the windows. I knew I had no choice but to put the pedal to the metal and drive. With a roar of the engine, I tore through the night, leaving the pack of dogman-like creatures behind in the rearview mirror. As I sped away, my heart pounding, I couldn't help but wonder if I had just encountered a ghostly hitchhiker or a malevolent spirit. One thing was certain, I'd never pick up another hitchhiker on a desolate highway again.
Not after the night I met the hitchhiker who vanished from an accident scene years ago. In the night, the dogmen, like creatures, tried to tear me apart. On the day it happened, I was hiking on a small trail alongside a stream off of a forest road in Lawson National Forest in northeastern California. There were a couple of cars along the road, so I thought it would be a safe place for me to hop onto a small trail. I like to hike in some odd places, practicing my navigation skills with a map and a compass and my phone GPS, app tracking my path. I like to pinpoint some unique land features on a topo map and go find them. I usually go with a group of orienteering friends, but that day I was hiking solo. When I'm alone, I don't go too far into the forest. However, the events of that day drove me deep into the forest. The stream was rather small compared to the actual stream bed, which was odd considering there had been a decent snowfall over the winter. I also noticed that there was a lot of algae in this stream and a quarter mile in. I could smell a rotting trout long before I came upon it. There were pieces of trash littered along the stream. I also came across a few small dead animals near the stream as I walked along the trail. It was disgusting, but I assume this is a popular area with teens or target shooters, and they probably left some trash behind. I didn't know that these were the warning signs of what I was walking into. About a mile in the trail diverged from the stream and cut through the shrubs and trees. I was close to my destination, a spot along the stream that looked like it could possibly have a small waterfall. The trail turned left and it opened up to a large flat clearing. I stopped immediately looking across the clearing. There was trash everywhere and there were rows of cultivated dirt, but the plants were all uprooted. There was a holding pond lined with plastic sheeting along the stream, and there was a pile of sports drink bottles filled with a milky pink fluid next to it. Along the edges of the garden were what looked like homemade spike strips, boards with nails driven through them. I could smell the distinct odor of marijuana in the air. This was an illegal growth site. There had been enough news reports about what happens to people who come across these illegal growth sites for me to know that I needed to get away fast. I turned and I ran into the shrubs on the opposite side of the trail. Hiding behind a crumbling tree stump, I checked my map to make sure I was heading into uneven terrain, where I would be unlikely to find another garden. The cars at the trailhead likely belonged to whoever was maintaining this garden, but since they weren't at this location, they were probably at another. I started to stand up, but dropped back down, holding my position when I heard a pair of male voices talking in Spanish. I recognized a few words like mountain and up when they were talking, and they kept repeating grand. Grande? When their voices faded away, I quietly started to go in the opposite direction, putting distance between me and them. The map indicated that if I kept going east, there were no streams and there would be some decent elevation changes. But afterward, there was a forest road I could follow. I walked straight through, maintaining an eastbound path for half an hour, until I heard a soft wailing sound coming from the left of me. I stopped dead in my tracks. It sounded like nothing I'd heard in the forest before. It didn't sound like an animal. It sounded human. I could smell a strange odor in the air, and I noticed some long tracks on the ground that looked like a bear double step, but one side had splotchy blood in it. I grabbed my bear spray and knife out of my bag and stood still, looking around for the source of the noise. I took a couple of steps forward, and everything went silent. Suddenly, I felt something crash into my left side from the rear, knocking me to the ground. I looked up terrified that it was a bear, but it looked like a massive man covered in dirty blonde hair and very tan skin. He grunted at me and then collapsed on the ground. His feet near my face, I could see a massive gash in the sole of his foot with pine needles and dirt sticking to the blood that was oozing out. I heard voices coming from the direction I had just come from. I wasn't sure if it was the same man, but I didn't want to risk it. I jumped up on my feet, smacked his leg, and said, Go! As loud as I dared, 
I started running east and I heard his limping footsteps pounding on the ground heading slightly north of me. There was a hill ahead with several large boulders that I could somewhat see through the thick trees. I continued running until I reached it. I climbed up the hill and I could smell that weird odor again. I followed the odor and I found the hairy man collapsed on his back on the ground. He was taking short, rapid breaths. I could see that he had two holes in the far right side of his chest where there was blood oozing as well. He looked human, yet he didn't. He looked like he could kill me single, handedly, but I had an overwhelming urge to help him. I knelt down beside him and grabbed his massive hand to try and check for his pulse. I could feel a strong beating under his skin, giving me hope. He looked at me with eyes that seemed to ask for help. I pulled the first aid kit out of my pack and looked at what I had trying to figure out the best way to make what I had work. I keep my day kit light, carrying only things that will patch me up enough to get to help. I only had two hemostatic gauze pads. The chest wounds were the most concerning. I put my ear near the wounds listening for sucking sounds, then applied the gauze when I heard none. I applied pressure for several minutes, then ripped two pieces of tape off of the roll to hold them there. His eyes were slightly open and watching me as I gestured for him to open his mouth. He closed his eyes with his mouth still shut. He could have indicated to me by now if he didn't want me touching him, so I went for it. I carefully pulled open his mouth to check his gums and tongue, keeping my fingers clear in case he decided to snap his mouth closed. His gums were dark, but his tongue was pink. I didn't see any signs that his lungs had been punctured, but when I looked at his teeth, they weren't quite like a human's. His canine teeth were larger, but not as oversized as a gorilla's. Once the critical injury was dressed, I went down to work on his foot, washing it gently with some water from my pack. He started moaning, lifting his head up and looking at me, but he didn't jerk his foot away. I did my best trying to clean it out, using one of my maxi pads to wipe away the debris and dry the skin. The cut was long, nearly an inch deep across most of it, and there was a hole on the top of his foot as well. His foot was very broad and flat, and the wound was trying to splay open. I filled the cut with ointment and used the tape to make massive butterfly strips to pull the two sides of the wound together, leaving drainage gaps between the strips. I left the hole on top, uncovered to serve as a drain as well. I then took my last maxi pad and strapped it to the bottom of his foot like a sandal using tape across the top. I looked back up at his face and I could see a small trickle of blood running on the ground by his head. I had missed a wound someplace. I went back to his side and pulled on his arm, hoping he would get the idea to roll over. He was too heavy for me to pull over without his help. Finally, he rolled onto his side and I found two jagged exit wounds on his back about the size of my thumb. I didn't have much left in my first aid kit, but I did have several tampons. I opened up the tampon package and put the applicator in about an inch deep and inserted the tampon leaving about a third of it outside of his body. I repeated this in the other hole and then pulled on his arm to get him on his back to keep pressure on the tampons. Once he was flat again, he closed his eyes and his breathing slowed down. He seemed to be sleeping. I stayed there watching him for a few minutes and cleaning up my trash when I heard shots in the distance. I needed to get down to where I could find help, but I couldn't leave him exposed. My cell phone didn't have service at this point, so I needed to get down to the road. I didn't think it was likely whoever was shooting the gun would come up the hill, but I gathered up the few branches I could find and covered him with them, hoping he would stay sleeping, until I came back. I started down the hill on the eastern side, heading towards the forest road. Once I hit the flat dirt, I ran south until I saw a truck heading down the road towards me. I could see the light bar on top, and I felt so relieved at that point. I knew I was safe. The ranger pulled up to me, and I broke down, relieved. I knew I couldn't come right out and talk about the Sasquatch. Instead, I told the ranger about the illegal grow, and... I said that I saw a severely wounded bear with young cubs they had shot. It was a lie, but I needed him to go back with me and check on him, and he probably wouldn't believe me if I said what he really was. 
We drove back to the hill, and we ascended where I hit him. The ranger was following close behind me with his gun drawn. The ranger wanted me to follow behind. I wanted to make sure I was the first face the Sasquatch saw. He likely wouldn't survive another gunshot wound, and if he slammed into the ranger as he did to me, the ranger would likely shoot. When I was able to see the top of the hill, I could see the branches, but he was gone. The blood from his back was still there, but the branches I'd covered him with were arranged into an X on the ground. It's been six years since that day, but I feel like it was yesterday. Since I didn't see him get his injuries, I'll never know for certain what happened. I've read stories about them being protectors of the forest, and I think that's what he was doing. These illegal growers divert water from streams to grow pot, and their camping garbage brings a lot of wildlife to their gardens. They use highly potent and sometimes illegal rodenticides and insecticides and large dye, also common around growth sites, everything from birds to bears. It would make sense that he would want to push them out of his forest. I'm certain he was shot, and I think when he was running away, he stepped on a spike strip and it ripped through his foot. I did my best to take care of him, and I wish I knew he was okay out there. I was a field engineer doing software installation and commissioning on telecom equipment controllers. These units are located at cell sites tower bases, which your phone connects to in order to provide you service and connectivity from your cell service provider. A lot of these towers are in very, very remote places. In this particular project, I would go in the day after the construction crews completed their tower and electrical work. I would be by myself with just my work truck, air card, and laptop. This particular site was in rural Virginia. I probably still have the email from when I was on that project with the site's coordinates, so I will try and post those later if I find them. If it's not against policy, of course, the site was about two, three miles into the deep woods of Virginia. It was near a now abandoned mine of some sort. Not sure exactly what they were mining for, but there was very old mining carts and drilling equipment scattered about as I was driving to the site. It was starting to get dark, but this was supposed to be a quick in-and-out type deal. LTE commissioning usually takes one hour or less, and since I saw a Civil War era cemetery connected to the gravel road which leads to the site, I was in more of a rush than usual. See, the thing is, when you try and rush things, especially because of fear, you will up. And boy, did I F up. Something that should have taken one hour took over four. When I finally completed my work and closed my laptop screen, I realized how dark it was outside and that I was all alone at the base of a tower in the middle of nowhere. I quickly gathered my belongings and headed towards my car, which was probably 60 yards away at the gate of the compound where the tower was located. When I tried to close the gate behind me, it was so dark that I couldn't see the chain and lock so I put my car in reverse, put the e-brake up, and shut off the ignition. This way, my reverse lights were lighting up the gate for me so I could close it, just trying to give you an idea of the utter darkness I was in. After all that, I headed down the trail to the secondary gate, which leads to the site about half a mile from the actual compound. Same situation as before. Too dark, so had the car in reverse. Well, when trying to close this gate, I heard in the distance what I can only describe as the most menacing and evil female laughter. It sounded like it was pretty far away, but I got shook to the bone. I left that secondary gate wide open and noped the hell out of there. On the drive out, I remembered the cemetery I had to drive by. Needless to say, I didn't look at it when drove past it on the way out. After speaking with the construction crew that built the site, they also said they heard people whispering in the woods at night, but could never spot anyone. They also heard what sounded like people picking at rock with tools, but they were certain no other construction or anything was taking place anywhere for miles on end. I am in the United States Coast Guard, and I recently was assigned to a ship. 
I was going through our logbooks to look up something and noticed that on the bridge, an unknown blue light was observed beneath the water's surface the night before. This intrigued me, so I started looking through more of the logs. Apparently every two, three weeks, they enter lights of varying colors in places you would not expect. Usually white, red, or green lights are on the horizon or in the sky, ships and aircraft. But they seem to report colored lights under the water, sometimes moving around, sometimes stationary. Lights in the sky moving at extreme speeds, then immediately stopping or disappearing altogether. Sometimes lights are visible to the naked eye, but when we try to look at it with flur or night vision, they are undetectable. I was in high school at the time, and right in front of our house, there was a secluded park. That park is empty and peaceful, but it gets crowded at a certain time of the day because of dog owners. So my dogs are not friendly, and because of that, we take them out a little bit early than others. Like usual, I checked the park out from window, and there was just a man walking around the park. I took my two dogs, Golden Retriever and Yorkshire Terrier, and went to park. I was listening to music and waiting for my dogs to do their thing. I realized that bald and middle-aged man was glancing at us, but he was keeping a distance. I usually know everyone that comes to that park, but it was my first time seeing that guy. I am a paranoid person and wanted to go, but my small dog were still looking for a place to poo-poo. When my dog was sniffing around, we had to stop walking. That guy got close to us and said, I have a friend, and he will bring two aggressive pit bulls here. You should get out. I was surprised and just said eight and got out. Didn't even question and walked out of the park. We could see the entire park clearly from our windows. I almost knew all the dogs that hang around in the park and even know their personalities. I never saw or heard about pit bulls nearby. After some time passed, no one was coming to the park. That man was walking kind of wobbly and talking to himself. He was holding some kind of small bag in his hand, and he was smelling that bag. We just understood immediately, but we were quiet, amazed by his trick to get me out. After some minutes, a grandpa and his grandchild were walking the hallway to park. That guy didn't even wait them to enter and ran to them and yelled like a crazy that poor old man was scared a lot. He didn't say anything and just left immediately. We were fine with him getting high in our park up until now. He took a thick tree branch and ran after cats. I got even more mad and made my mom call the police. They arrived 30 minutes later. That crazy guy walked on the police too. They took him and we didn't see him that day. After a winter, we saw him again. We were like, ah, oh, here we go again. It was our dog's toilet time again. I was studying to my exams and asked my mom to take him out. There was also a gardener and some kids in the park. She decided to go because she was not alone with him. Dogs did their thing and she was just going out. She was just about to leave. He walked on my mom and raised his arm. But thankfully he was so wobbly he couldn't get much close. The gardener was just watching from the corner. She screamed a little and went back home. He got taken by polices for three times, but he always got back on summer days. My dad was a merchant sailor. He has seen and done some shit, some things he still won't even tell me. Apparently there was this crew once probably more than once, that included this crazy guy that slept with a hatchet who was one room over from my dad, and also a guy who everyone hated. One day they woke up and the guy everyone hated was missing. There was some blood around one of the portholes. The way my dad puts it, you can't fit a grown man through one of those portholes whole. I've tried, so probably murder, and no one gave a shit. When I was about 10 years old, my mom had her second kid. We didn't have a ton of money, so it wasn't uncommon for our cars to break down or need to be repaired. 
Well, one day my mom, my baby sister, and I were heading to my aunt's house. She lived kind of up in the mountains, so to get there we had to take a pretty steep inclined highway. Then it veered off into the more rural area where my aunt lived. About halfway up the incline, my mom's car started to sputter. We could feel the car giving out, and I remember my mom just trying to get the car as close to the exit as possible. Well, the car didn't make it, and we broke down on the side of the highway. This was before cell phones were popular, so the only way to get help was to walk to the nearest payphone. We were probably about half a mile or so away from the exit, and... Right off that exit was a gas station. My mom told me to get as close to the guardrail as possible, and we began walking. Within a few moments, a man pulled up beside us and asked if we needed a ride. My mom cradled my sister, shoved me to the side, and quickly said, No to the man. She did that hip bump thing that people do, and at first, I was like, Daddy at TF because if I would have fallen over the rail, I would have tumbled down a pretty steep hill. But then I looked over and very clearly saw a gun on the man's front seat. It was half covered with a handkerchief, but it was clearly a small handgun. He pulled it closer to him and tried to fully conceal it, but both I and my mom had already seen it. He drove slowly beside us, trying to convince my mom to get in the car. But my mom just kept saying no but she wasn't rude or mean about it, calm as a clam, just friendly as could be. He finally pulled off as we got closer to the exit. I'm guessing he wanted to stay on the highway. Once he pulled off, my mom looked at me and said he was going to kill us. She was still eerily calm as if. My name is Ataraxia, and I'm in high school. Last year, I went through a bad episode of depression. I'm doing much better currently, and I was scrolling on TikTok and found a video of a girl who claimed she shifted into another reality in her sleep. At that point in my life, going to another reality, even just for a few hours a day, sounded great to me. Out of curiosity, I looked up tutorials and other info on YouTube, and it soon became an obsession. For about eight whole months... I dedicated my free time to learning how to shift. The shifting I'm talking about is not the kind where people say they went to an anime or Hogwarts or whatever. My desired reality, as they call it, was just a normal world where some of my problems did not exist. Since there are infinite realities that are similar to ours, I hope to reach one with those qualifications. On February 8, 2023, I decided to try shifting. I wrote down the date of when I went to sleep and the details of my desired reality. I tried my best to hold my vision of me waking up in that desired reality for as long as I could, but I fell asleep and had a dream of my previous day at school. I don't think the dream had to do with anything just adding it. I woke up disappointed and grabbed my phone to turn off my alarm and I saw that my wallpaper was different. I thought it was weird, but I, I thought maybe I changed it accidentally somehow because the new wallpaper was an old one I had not too long again. Then things started to get strange as I got ready for school. Things were very slightly different. The pink pot on my desk no longer had the Kirby face I painted on it. My shoes were in a different cubby than I placed them in. I go to a private school, so I place my school shoes in a top cubby so that they are easier to reach. I no longer had a paper cut on my thumb. My blazer was wrinkled and in the laundry, even though I washed it and ironed it on Monday, which would be February 6th. My jewelry dish was gone, and instead my earrings were just on my nightstand. Those are just a few of the differences I can remember right now. I instantly thought about the shifting thing I tried last night and assumed the worst, which is I am in another reality. I continued on with my day, and I found out that no, my problems were not gone, so this was not my desired reality. School was different, too. The road lines were much more worn out than usual on the way. Someone who I didn't know personally waved at me at school. I hit my hip really hard on a bench that I have never seen while turning my usual corner, pretty fast to get to buy a class. 
Our school banner in the courtyard was different. My assigned seat for religion class was different. My apps on my laptop were arranged differently. A character I had recently gotten in a gacha game was no longer on my account, and the currency count was different. Game was Honky Impact Third, and the character missing was Hersher of Truth, and a bunch of other small changes that I don't distinctly remember. All I could think about all day was the fact that I was somewhere different, and I was not home. I have never been one to be overly stressed and have panic attacks, but the stress was overwhelming and crushing. My head and eyes were hurting by the time I got home. When I got home, I went to bed and tried to shift back. I wrote on a piece of paper home over and over again and put it under my pillow, shifting method, and set it in my head and imagined myself waking up at home again. I fell asleep and woke up. I started crying from relief when I saw my Kirby pot with a face again. The experience felt surreal to me, almost like a really vivid dream, and I was very willing to peg it off as one. That's when I checked the date on my phone. It was Friday, February 10th. This meant I spent a day somewhere else. My friend that I didn't recall being with much yesterday, as I spent my two breaks in the bathroom panicking, at school even asked me if I was all right and that she was worried about me. Last night, since I had been acting different and was very stressed out yesterday, she knows that I am struggling with depression. I said it was nothing and that I was perfectly fine. Does this mean that I switched consciousnesses with another me? And if that was the case, did we both try to shift that same night? Or was it just me? Did I shift? Was this a dream? Was it something else? Either way, I took this as a sign to never try shifting ever again. Home for summers during college friends, and I would often grab a couple of 12 packs and drive off into the woods somewhere and have a little fire. Nothing crazy, just a few beers and shooting the shit. Our normal spot had gotten blown up. Someone had blocked off the road, so we decided to go off in the woods on my friend's farm. There was no road, so we are just walking through the woods in the dark, looking for a good spot when we hear coy dogs howling in the distance. Then we hear coy dogs howling from behind us. Eventually, they are howling all around us and clearly getting closer. We noped the F out and ran back to the car. I was walking on the Jedediah Smith Redwood State Park in the Stout Memorial Grove. It is approximately one mile in circumference. I was going to go to the left and circle around, but there were two young guys that started to walk off. Trail to a big tree, so I went to the right. I thought it was the two guys messing around, but I didn't hear any laughter after it. The hair on my arm stood up after I heard screams. I turned around immediately to leave because it was getting late, around 6.40 p.m., and the sun was starting to set. About 20 feet back down the trail, I noticed a black figure standing about 120 feet from where the two young guys were standing earlier. At first, I thought it was a bear standing up because it was about seven feet tall and backlit by the sun. The face was partially obscured by a branch, and it was too far away to detect an odor. I took two quick photos of it and left. I didn't realize what I had photographed until later when I reviewed the photos. Unfortunately, they're bad, so I won't post them here. Also, the creature was strikingly all black, seven foot tall, animal standing on hind legs. Its weight looked to be between 250 to 400 pounds and looked like a bodybuilder. It had a long muzzle, long pointed ears with tufts on them, really long arms with a big chest and a smaller waist. A branch covered a portion of its face. It was about 30 yards away. This was not a bear. It looked like a werewolf. Visiting a friend in California. My last night there, and we're talking about how I hadn't seen any redwoods. So we hop in the car at 11 o'clock at night and head off to some forest trail that he knows. 
We get there, and there is a gate with a sign on it, which we don't read. He's carrying his toy poodle. We walk a little ways, but the trees aren't that big. He says they get bigger further in and sparks up a joint, and we keep walking. Maybe a half mile in, we hear the loudest scream I've ever heard. We stop and looked at each other, and my friend says, I think someone just got murdered. We stood there for a few minutes to see if we heard anything else, and then we heard it again. It seemed to be closer, but it was tough to tell as it was echoing. Still no clue what it is, but we decide we should probably get out of there. Didn't really think much of it afterwards until I read an article about a mountain lion stalking someone, and there was audio of the sound mountain lions make. I send a link to my friend saying I think we are lucky to be alive. He laughs and says, yeah. No, I was up that way recently and noticed that the sign on the gate is a warning for mountain lions in the area. When in the RAFI was based at Scampton, this was the base where the Dam Busters raid was launched from and a bomber command airfield during the war. I was on guard duty one night and had a phone call around 2 a.m. about noises coming from one of the hangars. Sent a guard to investigate. He radios back and says he can hear voices mumbling and what sounds like machinery operating and tools clanging, etc. I got out the keys to the hangar and on driving up, sure enough, there were such noises going on and the occasional flickering light. We called in the RAF police dogs, but the land shark refused to go in. This highly trained attack dog lay down, whimpered, and refused to listen to its handler. I went in with a guard and the RAF policeman and can only describe the feeling on entering the hangar floor as being surrounded in a cold fog that you couldn't see and a real feeling of dread. There was a real feeling of unhappiness in the place. I have never felt like that since, nor do I ever want to. We hightailed it out as it was secure, and there was clearly no one there. Found out about a year or so later, when speaking to some visiting Bomber Command veterans, that it was a hangar used in the war for battle repairs. On the damaged aircraft, and sometimes where aircraft which had crew members killed in them, and sometimes it took some time to either extract their bodies or gather up the bits, would be taken to be clean. I have been back to Scampton since, but I give that hangar a very wide berth. My father had always been drawn to the great outdoors. Growing up, he would often accompany my grandfather on their expeditions, exploring various places with a sense of curiosity that seemed to run in the family. It was no surprise that my father eventually became a park ranger, immersing himself in the beauty of nature and creating countless memories for our family. There was a particular holiday season when the National Park welcomed an influx of tourists seeking adventure. Some were simply looking for a fun experience, while others were engaged in field research. Among them was a team of five researchers, a group that stood out with their intelligence and sanity, surpassing even the most educated of visitors. Late one night, my father received a distress signal on his walkie, talkie from one of his fellow researchers. Equipped with his trusty rifle, he embarked on a mission to investigate. As the terrain became impassable for his jeep, they continued on foot, deciding to split up and search in two different directions to cover more ground. To ensure their safety and avoid getting lost, they tied ribbons along their respective paths, yellow for my father and blue for one of his partners. As my father ventured deeper into the woods, he found no trace of the rest of the group. Attempting to contact his partner through the walkie, talkie proved futile. There was no response. Undeterred, he pressed on, tying ribbons along the way. However, he began to notice something peculiar. He kept encountering yellow ribbons tied to trees, suggesting that he might have taken a different route than he intended. After a brief rest under a tree, he examined one of the ribbons more closely and realized it wasn't the same ribbon he had tied earlier. These ribbons appeared weathered and worn, and unlike his single knot, these were double-knotted, this raised a sense of unease within him. 
The area they were in was restricted, reserved for important personnel only. Who could have journeyed this far and tied these yellow ribbons? Determined to unravel the mystery, my father decided to follow these unfamiliar markers, hoping they would lead him to the correct ones. As he retraced his steps, he heard faint sounds and noticed flickering lights emanating from a certain direction. Curiosity got the better of him, and he cautiously approached the source of the commotion. To his horror, he stumbled upon a group of researchers wearing bizarre attire, engaged in a macabre dance around a central fire. Four individuals were present, but one was conspicuously missing. Hidden behind a tree, my father observed as two members of the group emerged from the woods, carrying a large wooden branch with a man bound to it. The man's hands and legs were tightly secured, and it was evident that he had met a grim fate. He had been prepared for some horrific ritual cooked alive. Shaken by what he had witnessed, my father attempted to contact his partner for assistance, yet no response came. Realizing the danger he was in, he decided to make his escape. As he turned to flee, he sensed a lingering presence, something lurking in the shadows. These cannibalistic murderers were still pursuing him. In a desperate attempt to divert their attention, my father climbed up a tree, silently praying that they would leave. From his vantage point, he observed their ghastly appearance, emaciated, white-skinned creatures resembling humans, but with grotesque features. Their hollowed-out eyes and elongated fangs sent chills down his spine. Finally, they dispersed, unaware of his hidden perch, carefully descending the tree. My father cautiously scanned his surroundings, ensuring the creatures were gone. Exhausted and drained, he began to lose consciousness. It was then that he realized he had been poisoned, some unknown substance seeping into his skin. Collapsing onto the forest floor, his next recollection was waking up in a hospital bed. When my father recounted the harrowing incident to senior officials, they dismissed his claims and denied any clearance he had held. It wasn't long after that he was stripped of his position as a park ranger, stripped of everything he had worked for in his career. Subsequently, he received multiple death threats, a grim reminder of the sensitive information he possessed and the things he had seen that fateful day, an ominous secret that could never be allowed to reach the public. I grew up on an Indian reservation here in Oklahoma. I am Cherokee Indian. Our home was by a massive cave system and in the middle of two hills. There is a cave on the property that everyone on the reservation knows Sasquatch exists. It is common knowledge where we come from. We would know their moods just by the sounds he made. When he was upset, you would know it because his anger would be heard throughout the whole reservation. People talked about it in casual conversation. For instance, did you hear Sasquatch upset last night, etc.? My grandparents told me not to fear him because they had a pact with him and he would not harm us. All was good until more Sasquatch came. These were evil ones, not the same as the Sasquatch that had always been there. He had been run off from the territory, we believe. I had to walk down a long dirt road to get to my school bus. They would chase me up in the woods, whooping and throwing rocks at me. I was terrified and I got a feeling they wanted to hurt me. It kept getting worse. I refused to even walk to school after that. At night, when my cousins would come over, we would all play outside in the front yard. These new Sasquatch would gather around in the hills with their glowing red eyes and watch us. I know if our parents would have not been out there, they would have taken us and harmed us. I could feel it. I could sense their body and their bad intentions. I told my family that they were bad. My uncle did not listen. He went for a walk alone to the water, which was like a mile and a half from his house. He was drowned in knee, deep water, and was an avid swimmer. No wounds, just a mysterious death. But I knew they killed him. He was the first of many unknown mysterious deaths that started to occur by the water. In that area, the person was always alone. It was always a mystery. 
I'm glad I stuck with my gut feelings because they were getting more aggressive every day that I walked to school. I believe my instinct saved my life. To this day, they're still killing people in the area. The person is always alone and the death is always a mystery. But I know and so do the other people on the reservation. Always follow your instincts. I'll send you more stories at a later date. Thank you for reading. I was at a summer camp that separated boys from the girls. We would normally sleep in separate cabins. However, this being a nice night, our counselors decided it would be nice to camp outside. Being overly testotroned high schoolers given new freedom of the outdoors, we decided to separate from our supervision and beeline for the girls' campsite. Upon successfully reaching their site and being dumbfounded at what to do, we decided that throwing miscellaneous items into the fire, creating subsequent explosions, would be a good icebreaker. Unfortunately, due to our brilliance, we were quickly brought back to our camp and separated from the girls. Not being discouraged, we decided to regroup and try again. As we began to leave for their site again, we heard an extremely loud bang as if from a high-caliber rifle. The sound was followed by another bang, followed by silence. We all became paralyzed, unsure what to do. Was it from the girl's sight? We were too afraid to find out. We could see a flashlight in the distance mulling around the area. I only remember lying quietly, barely able to sleep, joking with fellow campers who would get shot first if that bang was indeed from a gun. The next morning, we woke up alive and very confused to what had happened. I actually only found out what had happened when I got home from camp. A man had shot his axe at a house right by the campsite we were staying that night. What stood out to me the most, other than aforementioned, was an interview with a neighbor who didn't call the police right away because she figured the sound was from some stupid kids blowing up things at a campsite. I led a small expedition of 12 Marines, tasked with recovering a downed aircraft rumored to have encountered a massive, unknown sea creature. It was a mission shrouded in mystery, and our team was a mix of experienced soldiers and unique individuals. One such individual was Jack, a fellow Marine who, in his free time, embraced his love for gambling and dabbled in the world of acting. We descended into the depths, our hearts pounding with anticipation. The murky waters swallowed us whole, enveloping us in a realm where light struggled to penetrate. We maneuvered cautiously, scanning the underwater landscape until our eyes widened in disbelief. There it was, a sunken aircraft resting on the ocean floor. As we swam closer to investigate, the sense of danger grew palpable. Suddenly, without warning, a colossal aquatic predator materialized before us. Its sheer size defied all logic, dwarfing even the wreckage of the downed aircraft. The beast's enormous jaws gaped wide, revealing rows of razor-sharp teeth that gleamed menacingly in the dim light. Panic and chaos ensued as the creature lunged towards us, its fury unleashed. The water churned with violence as we fought desperately to survive. Harpoons were thrown with precision, aiming for vulnerable spots, while gunfire echoed through the depths. Jack, with his quick thinking, managed to shoot the creature directly in its eyes, momentarily stunning it. Exploiting the creature's temporary vulnerability, we launched our final assault. Grenades were hurled with deadly accuracy, finding their mark in the creature's gaping maw. The water erupted in a cataclysmic explosion as the beast thrashed in its death throes. It was a battle of survival, a fight against an ancient leviathan that threatened to unleash chaos upon the world. But victory came at a devastating cost. Ten of my comrades, brave Marines who had faced the unimaginable with unwavering resolve, met their untimely end in the jaws of the creature. Only Jack and I emerged from the depths, battered but alive, as we floated in the water, a mixture of relief and sorrow washed over us. 
The beast that had haunted us had been vanquished, but the sacrifice of our fallen comrades would forever weigh heavy on our hearts. We resurfaced, the sun welcoming us back into its warm embrace. The ocean, once a serene backdrop, now held the memories of a battle fought and lives lost. With a mission complete, we returned to our base, determined to honor the fallen. A few years ago, I was traveling in northern India with my girlfriend at the time. Being young and stupid, we decided to hike up a nearby mountain without really doing any research on the area or how long it would take. It was an amazing hike. We met locals along the way who gave us chai tea, climbed up through thick, misty cloud forest, and were even joined by a friendly stray dog who traveled with us until we reached the top, which was like a kind of grassy plateau. There were a few other tourists spaced out in tents, some other cute stray dogs, classic India, and a local guy who was serving food. Now, thank F for this local guy because we didn't have a tent and it was dark. We foolishly thought we could hike back in the same day. Anyway, we borrowed this guy's spare tent. It was a one-person tent, so super tight for two, and make Camp 30 my way from everyone to have privacy. We were asleep for maybe an hour, then suddenly awoke to this really low, deep growl right at my face. It was a stray dog outside the tent, then more growls at our feet. We were surrounded by these strays that only hours before we were playing with happily. Every single noise or slight movement we made in this tiny tent would be met with deafening barking, more growling, and you could see faint shadows through the fabric. Some of the dogs were even leaning against the tent, testing it. I punched a few through the fabric to scare them, but nothing worked. We ended up not saying a word. My girlfriend was crying silently, holding our breath for fear of provoking them and staying perfectly still the whole night. It was terrifying. We knew we would be killed by them. When the sun came up, we couldn't hear anything. After listening for ages, I manned up and took a peek outside the tent. No dogs to be seen. I crawled out on my hands and knees, and suddenly, a dog came running up to my face and started licking me. It was friendly as it was yesterday. I walked up to the local guy who gave us the tent to tell him what a mess night we had, and these dogs are crazy. He goes, and I'll never forget his face. Oh, they were protecting you. There are snow leopards and sloth bears up here that have been known to kill locals every now and then. I went back to the tent, and sure enough, there amongst the dog paw prints were what looked like something much bigger. By far the most scared I've ever been in my life. When I was around 14 or 15, I went with my cousin and brother to go check out some land my cousin's friend's family bought to fish on. The land was a good few acres and located right next to their very large suburban neighborhood in Georgia. All you had to do was pull onto a curb in the neighborhood and take a small dirt path across a lake, and after a small turn, the path ran about a mile in a straight line down the middle of the property to a larger lake. When we went, we took a golf cart since nobody wanted to walk and pulled onto the property. After taking the small left turn onto the main path, we all just froze. Walking towards us at the opposite end of the path, there was a man with a jacket and ski mask on. We all saw him. He wasn't holding anything. He wasn't running, and he wasn't speaking. We stopped the golf cart, but we couldn't turn around on the path since it was so thin, and there was foliage to both sides of us. The person was still at least half a mile down the path, just walking, but we were all still terrified. Also, it didn't help that the oldest in our group was 16, and the driver was 12. Despite being young, however, my cousin put the golf cart into reverse, which makes the loudest high-pitch whine ever, and reversed the entire quarter-mile pedal to the metal, which is still pathetically slow in an electric golf cart. When we told his parents, all of the adults came out with us and looked all over. 
as well as set up two plot watchers they had to see if they spotted anything. There was nothing on the cameras, and they have still never seen anyone in those woods since then, despite hunting there all the time. I grew up in the late 90s, early 2000s. I spent a lot of time outside, and I loved all animals, including bugs, frogs, and lizards, etc. My little brother played a lot of sports, so on weekends I was always dragged to his games, and after school I often had to attend his practices. It was soccer season, and I had to go with my mom to one of my brother's soccer practices after school on this day. I was probably half eight or nine at the time, it was at a local park surrounded by some wilderness and some hiking trails. I liked this park because off to the side of the soccer fields was a creek with frogs and stuff. I'd love to go over there and look at them and try to catch them, etc. It was evening time and the sun was setting, but there was still plenty of light left. I told my mom I was gonna go down to the creek to catch frogs. It was down the hill slightly from the fields and obscured by some bushes and shrubs. But there was a clear dirt trail that ran alongside the creek. So I scurried on down there and was carefully studying the creek looking for frogs. When suddenly a man's voice startles me. What you looking for? I look up and see a middle-aged man dressed in typical office, business wear, button-up shirt, slacks, dress shoes. He was standing on the trail, blocking my route back up to the soccer fields, looking at me and smiling. I was a shy and cautious child. So I just looked at the man and didn't reply at first. My spidey senses were already tingling, and I remember feeling nervous and uneasy. I sometimes saw hikers on the trail by the creek, but his outfit and appearance told me this wasn't a hiker. He then asked me, are you looking for butterflies? I saw some down there as he points further down the trail, away from the soccer fields. I just said no and started looking around at what my options were. I felt the need to get out of there fast. But as I mentioned, he was standing on the trail, which was my route back to the fields. There were thick bushes on the hillside between the trail and where the fields were. I started making my way up the rocks to the side of the creek towards the trail, further down from where he stood. And to my alarm, he started moving down the trail toward me. Need some help, he said. I was now starting to panic, although nothing had happened and he seemed friendly. It just felt wrong to me. I just got stranger danger vibes. I remember feeling a burst of adrenaline and fear. I shouted no and booked it up the rocks across the trail and crashed my way through the bushes towards the soccer fields. I remember the branches scratching me, but... I didn't care. I literally scrambled my way through them till I came up to the fields and then sprinted over to where my mom was watching my brother's practice. I probably looked like hell, so she, of course, asked what the heck happened, and I told her. I felt like she thought I was just being paranoid, though. I'll never know if this guy posed a real threat or not. He could have been just getting some fresh air on his way home from work. Who knows? I just know it felt creepy at the time. Five years ago, I found myself deep within the salmon, Huckleberry Wilderness, 18 air miles east of Estacada, Oregon. It was a place of raw beauty. It was a moonlit night. My hiking companions and I had set up camp near a pristine lake, eager to spend the night under the starry sky. The atmosphere was filled with laughter and excitement as we exchanged stories around the crackling campfire. However, as the night grew darker, an eerie silence fell upon the forest. Suddenly, piercing screams tore through the stillness, jolting us from our conversation. The chilling sound seemed to originate from the heart of the wilderness, carrying an otherworldly quality that sent shivers down our spines. Fear gripped us as we scrambled to pack our belongings. Panic spread like wildfire, and one man, overcome by terror, lost control and wet his pants. We were desperate to escape the clutches of whatever creature or force was responsible for those blood-curdling screams. With trembling legs, we began our hasty retreat, stumbling through the underbrush and over fallen logs. 
Adrenaline coursed through my veins, pushing me forward despite the exhaustion that weighed heavy on my limbs. The air hung heavy with tension and the pungent scent of fear. As we made our way through the darkness, a swarm of bats suddenly erupted from the forest canopy. Chaos ensued, and one of the creatures became entangled in the hair of the man closest to me. His panicked cries mingled with the flapping wings of the bat, creating a cacophony of terror. It was a moment of sheer terror, amplifying the already unsettling atmosphere surrounding us. Seeking safety and solace, we pressed on, desperately hoping to leave the haunted echoes of the banshee's screams behind. Our path led us through an area enveloped in a putrid odor, a stench that defied description. It was as if the very essence of fear and decay had taken physical form, assaulting our senses and leaving us gasping for fresh air. Eventually, we emerged from the depths of that haunted night, stumbling into the dim light of dawn. Exhausted and shaken, we collapsed onto the forest floor, grateful to have escaped whatever malevolent presence had haunted our wilderness retreat. My grandfather told me the story about the eerie incident that made him quit being a ranger. My grandfather used to work to be a park ranger in Uganda and had many stories to tell us about misbehaving teenagers who thought it was funny to stay illegally in the park overnight, white supremacist tourists who think they could hunt any time, and even indigenous people who believed the land belonged to them. But this time he told me the story why he resigned from being a ranger as he thought I was old enough to hear this creepy story. And after hearing it, I'm thankful for him quitting or else I probably wouldn't be here today. One day he and his co-worker, let's call him Sam, went out to patrol at night. As they were walking, they saw a very high unusual amount of snake activity everywhere. Ignoring it, they continued on their job and they had heard multiple trumpets of elephants and saw many zebras running in no particular direction, just away from the place that he and his co-worker were going deeper into the depths of the forest. They assumed that it was somebody, possibly teenagers, causing trouble. This made them cautious and alert for danger. They continued going deeper in with their rifles loaded and lamps in front of them. Then they saw a blue shimmery light glowing in the shape of a circle in the forest. It looked to be like a portal. My grandfather had advised his co-worker to examine it. As Sam leaned in to touch it, he was immediately sucked in like a vacuum. Now, I'm not relating Derek to trash, but who touches a portal? After waiting a few moments for Derek to come out, but as expected, he didn't. My grandfather ran away from the portal and towards the cabin of rangers. There, he shared this unnatural incident with the rest of the rangers who slept there. They collectively decided to go check it out the next morning. The next morning, they went to the same place. When my grandfather saw the portal, there was no portal and no sign of Derek either. His co-workers then did not believe him and said that Derek must have slipped drugs and hallucinated the whole thing. My grandfather resigned after that. He did not want to see more supernatural incidents happening and also did not want to die. And there was a huge cover-up that happened with Derek and him disappearing. Is he still alive in some alternate universe? Did he turn into something like a ghost? Is he dead? Nobody knows? This evening I'm going to be telling you about a sighting that I had back in July while working the night shift. It was just me and my partner that night. We were going around the highway right around 11 p.m. But as it turns out, our second call came in the day right around 10.40 p.m. In Ohio State Highway Patrol jurisdiction, there are no set speed limits on any roads except the Turnpike and a few other select highways so when we get calls to investigate speeders, we have to find probable causes that somebody is going above the posted speed limit. Now it was about 10.45 and I see a car passing from behind at seemingly high speeds. I didn't think much of it at first, but 
when I noticed the brake lights turning on and off, at first I thought somebody was just messing around. But then it became apparent this guy was trying to warn me. I turned on my lights and siren and immediately got behind this person. We were driving into a heavily forested area, so there were no lights. And it wasn't until I turned my spotlight on that I was able to see what he was trying to warn me about. There was a humanoid figure standing in the middle of the road. It appeared to be wearing all white like robes. And it did not move at all, just standing still in the road. The reason I knew this person had to have seen this thing is that he too pulled over right into the closest shoulder. As soon as he approached this thing, I get out of my car and shine my light onto this person, and it immediately sprints off into the trees like some sort of wild animal, yet completely unhuman. Despite how quickly it moved, it made no noise running or running through the brush. My partner comes up behind me asking if I saw what he saw, and I responded with, Yeah, I did, in a very uneasy tone. Despite being unable to explain what it was that I just saw, all I can think about was getting back in our car and driving away. The other officer asked me if I wanted him to go in after it so we could at least figure out what kind of animal it might have been. But the fact that this thing wasn't making any noise while running, kind of, gave me the feeling that whatever was running through those woods knew exactly where it was going, which led me to believe that chasing after it would likely be trying to catch a ghost. We didn't see anything else throughout our shift besides some drunk drivers and people purposely not wearing their seatbelts. All in all, another uneventful night besides this. Me and a buddy were doing some backcountry hiking in the Great Basin in an area where all sorts of weird shit was prone to happening. There was some restricted military base in the general area, lots of military testing and maneuvers, and lots of crazy-ass weirdos that came through that area. We crested a tall hill and were looking out over a valley when we saw two other guys on a hill across from us. I took a look at them through my binox, and they looked pretty normal. One had a rifle, but that didn't concern me because lots of people would skeet shoot and such up in that region. I decided to give them a holler and wave just to let them know we were in the area just in case they were shooting. Well, they noticed us, and the guy with the rifle raised it and pointed it in our direction. I tried to dismiss it as him using his scope to be able to see us as we were pretty far away. We resume hiking and next thing I know I hear shots landing on the hill we're on. Not terribly close, but uh, we hoof it down that hill and up another one and I break out the binox again. Well, those two guys had now made it across to the hill we were on before and were skulking around the brush. If that, I decided we needed to get back to camp but that we couldn't make a beeline because it would take us across the valley and we would be spotted in a second. I saw that there was an old dry washout that was the perfect depth to conceal us. We snuck our way down into it and it was literally like being in a trench surrounded by sheer dirt walls. We followed it around and up to safety, but it was pretty harrowing being in there because you couldn't see too much above and so we had no clue where those guys were. My buddy told me a story over ice fishing this past weekend. So my boss has tons of private property in northern Michigan, and he offered to let me hunt there this year. So I took him up on the offer quickly, as I've put up with central Michigan public land for years. Anyways, come September, I got out there and put three hang-on tree stands with screwing steps. Yeah, yeah, I know. Not legal, but that's the only thing I'm comfortable climbing, and I take them out after I leave. In various locations. Keep in mind, this is private. Nobody else is supposed to be hunting within miles of me. Fast forward to late October, and I managed to get out there after a very busy work schedule. Roofing sucks go to school kids for a weekend. So Friday, I take my bait out to one of my stands, the closest one to the cabin. 
I get there and notice there isn't much deer sign, so I decide to lug my bag out three miles down until the swamp where I find my next stand with heavy sign, so I spread my pile out. I put my steps in so I can climb it in the morning and begin to head back. The third stand, the furthest one out, was only a mile away from the one I was at situated on the side of a fairly large hill. I get within a quarter mile of it on my GPS when suddenly I begin to pick up on a bad feeling, like my body was telling me something was up. Normally I know better than I go against this, but this is as remote as you can get from Michigan, so I carried on. The closer I got, the worse the feeling got. I got within 50 yards when I just froze. Something was wrong. The tree my stand was in was empty. There was no stand, but just to my right in front, about 30 feet from the tree, was my stand, mangled and broken. I ran over to it and started investigating. In front of the stand, five feet away on the ground, was a massive and fresh impact mark on the ground where it had hit, then bounced against a tree. Hard enough to leave a mark, again fresh, on the tree and cleanly snap the seed off. I then turned to me tree. I looked for marks and found none. Just the old marks from where I screwed my steps in a month and a half ago when I set it up. No footprints, nothing around the tree. Someone, or something, unstrapped my stand and threw it from twenty-five feet up the tree and traveled through the air, the same distance to the ground. This stand was not light either easily 60 pounds. I knew I needed to get out of there quick, so I booked it straight to the cabin. Stupid me went out to hunt the next morning in the stand with bait. I hunted from sun up to sundown, not seeing a damn thing. So around dark, I started to pack up. Where I was facing, I could see the hill where I had the other stand. And just as I was about to get down, I could see a light. Then two, then four or five lights. They were moving erratically around the general area of the stand. It was so silent I could barely hear some faint voices. I noped out of there silently in in the dark. The next day, I was done. I had decided to pick up my remaining stands and leave. I went to the stand I hunted in the next day, when I seen the stand hanging in the tree next to the one I was in off a branch. I didn't investigate. I turned around and ran back to the truck. I was done. Nope, that was that. Called my boss and told him what was up. His theory was meth heads or marijuana growers. As for me, I have no clue. It was the time leading up to Easter, and our family was residing on a sprawling ranch near Malala, Oregon. Life on the ranch revolved around tending to our cattle, chickens, turkeys, and pigs. One particular evening as we made our way home, the headlights illuminated an astonishing sight. In the glow, we caught a glimpse of a rare albino Bigfoot, crouched behind some bushes, attempting to conceal itself. But it was too late. We had already laid eyes on the extraordinary creature. Standing at an impressive seven feet tall, it sported long flowing hair that cascaded down its body, reaching an astonishing length of eight to nine inches. The hair, a light cream color, was a striking contrast against the darkness of the night. In that moment, my mom jokingly remarked, Looks like the Easter Bunny's back again. It seemed that this was becoming somewhat of an annual tradition the third consecutive year that we had encountered the white Bigfoot, always around the Easter season. It would linger in the vicinity for several consecutive nights, evidenced by the howling of our dogs. Our ranch was located near the town of Colton, which had been mentioned earlier, making it a close neighbor to these mysterious encounters. Each sighting left us in awe and wonder with the enigmatic presence of the white Bigfoot becoming a part of our Easter festivities, adding an element of excitement and intrigue to the season. Back to Creepy. This was out by a campground of several natural springs. A friend and I, same buddy from before, decided to strike out and go explore some very dilapidated and ancient 
looking farm structures we'd seen earlier in the day. We decided to go at night because of being sane, right? It was a small cluster of buildings far off next to some woods. We hiked through the brush to get there, but there was also a really torn up, weed, choked dirt road that led to it. The buildings were completely decrepit and looked like they were going to collapse if we breathed too hard. We went to the biggest barn-like building and immediately began to smell death. As we got to the interior, we noticed some really unnerving things. First, despite the fact that these buildings no longer had any functional purpose, it was clear that people still went out there. There were fresh footprints that did not belong to us. Second, there seemed to be blood spattered all over the place. Third, there were pieces of wood that had been sharpened into crude short stakes that were absolutely drenched in blood. Fourth, there were scattered clumps of what looked, to me at least, to be human hair. Lastly, it looked like someone had used the blood-stained stakes to try and scrawl something on a couple walls and on a load-bearing post in the center of the building. I couldn't make it out. Probably better that way. So yeah, we decided to DTFO immediately. We decided to leave via a slightly different route because we were ultra-paranoid that someone was watching and would follow us back to camp. As we made our way back, we hit a truly putrid wall of that death stench again. We found the source. It was the rear half of a calf. Just the rear half. The front half was absolutely nowhere in sight. The worst thing about it, though, is that this animal was cut clean in half. It did not look like an animal attack at all. No other wounds. Just perfectly snipped in half. We made it back to camp and left the next morning. I was 16, 17, around 2009, with a group of friends, eight of us maybe, walking down my block in Forest Park, Illinois, heading towards one of my friend's house. It was summer, around 9 p.m. The sun was already set. Once we made it to the end of my block at an intersection, perched atop of 20 feet streetlight was a figure. Humanoid, definitely, but with wings standing relatively still. I and all of my friends saw it, started out it for maybe a few seconds, all muttering, WTF. After those seconds of collective confusion, the thing spread its wings fully. I don't think either of us saw it fly off or anything because the moment it did that, we all took off running, half of us one way and the other half another, guessing neither of us has ever run that fast in our lives. I eventually made it to the friend's house we were originally intending to get to. Obviously, we were freaked out, asking each other, WTF did we just see? Honestly, really not talking about it too much after the situation. I'm 29 now. None of those friends that I still keep in contact with remember seeing red eyes. But everything else was the same as how the Mothman is described. At this time, neither of us had even heard of the Mothman or even that there has been a sighting in the Chicago area. But I, without a doubt, know what I saw was real, because the group saw the exact same thing at the exact same moment. If I was by myself, I don't know if I would have believed it. Honestly, we were out of there so fast that I couldn't pick up much of the vibes that it gave off. All I know is that wasn't an owl, a crane, or a a drone. It kind of reminded me of the creature from the Jeepers Creepers film, if you know of that movie. Not a scary one, but it was definitely pretty awesome to me. I saw fresh deer signs going into this meadow through some aspen when I was out for an early morning hike. I approached the clearing from downwind and made my way toward it, almost imperceptibly slow. The grass in the clearing was ridiculously tall and lush and covered in cool dew, and I could see why the deer would have found this so attractive on a summer morning. I made my way into the grass and got near into the middle when I saw a six-point buck come out from behind some trees on the other side. He looked at me for a minute and knocked his antlers a little bit against a tree. I didn't want to get him riled, so I lowered myself into the grass. When I did that, the whole herd of does quietly stood up all around me. 
They were bedded in the grass, and I couldn't see them. They didn't seem spooked at all, and just lazily started to make their way out of the clearing. A small doe strolled by so close, in fact, that I almost wanted to touch her. Just a really serene and beautiful sight. My cousin and I were on our second elk hunt. It was rifle season in the Oregon Cascades. We had been hunting hard, and we are pretty much exhausted from hiking and trying to locate elk. We decided that we would hit up a small valley that everyone else was avoiding due to terrain and vegetation. Beginning of our backpack hunting, we left camp at 3 a.m. and set out to a point that overlooked a corner of an old burn that had a small river flowing through the bottom. After a couple hours of fighting with rhododendrons, we came out to the burn, and shortly after we got to our destination. About noon, we were deciding that no animals existed in the area, and were about to leave when I just happened to glance over at a patch of blowdown and saw a nice five-by-five five stand up. I blurted out, Bull. Thankfully, he was far enough away that I didn't spook him. After a while of trying to decide what to do, we got close enough, or so I thought for a reasonable shot. I missed twice. After a few minutes of looking around, he trotted down to a meadow that was significantly deeper into the burn and valley. We decided to get closer and try again. We made it to a little hill that looked over the meadow, but were running out of light and the wind was all wrong. By this point, the bull and his small herd had bedded down just off to the side of the meadow. We were around four to five miles from the camp and had some really gnarly terrain to get through. I figured we probably wouldn't get another chance at the bull if we left and thought the herd might stay and come back out to feed in the morning. We went to the backside of the little hill and made a half ass shelter with rocks and sticks. I made a small fire and we went to sleep. I woke in the middle of the night to my phone vibrating. It was a message from my wife on my Garmin. She said that she hoped we were able to make it back to the truck because the weather forecast called for three feet of snow in the higher elevations of the Cascades. I was thinking about how crappy the situation had become when I started hearing strange sounds coming from the bottom of the hill, down by the water. It sounded like a mix of laughter and crying with some noises almost sounding metallic. Think rusty gate hinges. I woke my cousin up and he was just as disturbed by it as I was. We stayed silent and just listened. It was downright creepy and lasted until around 4 a.m. Needless to say, we didn't sleep. We did see the elk again, but didn't take a shot because of the upcoming storm. Never figured out what the noise was either. My story starts about 25 years ago, 17 years old. I used to take a shortcut through the woods, Freeport, Long Island, New York, and heading towards the shortcut, I'd say maybe about 12 blocks, I had to go through like a marshy swamp area. About a hundred yards in, it's dark. It's in the back of an old railroad station. No lit light. You could barely see. You could barely see 20 or 30 yards. About a hundred yards in there, I had to follow a trail along a fence. I had to sit down to smoke a cigarette. I'm sitting there, 17 years old. I'm not scared of much, especially growing up in New York. All kinds of surprises, until after this experience. So out in the marsh, I'm sitting down and out in the marsh, I hear some dog tags, you know, clanking together. I didn't think much of it. There are a lot of dogs out there goofing off. And as I sat there, the chains just started coming closer. The tags were clinking and clanking and started coming closer. So I'm thinking a dog's on its way. No big deal. No need for alarm. As my ears, I couldn't really see. To my left was a creek that came out of a pipe that came from under the property. It wrapped around in front of me to about a 10 or 12 yard drop to the creek. The creek's about 10 yards and a sandbank on the other side. Then there's some type of marshy small trees, and then you could see maybe 10 or 20 yards past the creek. Those clanking sounds are coming, closer and closer. My ears are telling me that it should be visible soon, should be coming into my range. And I still thought it was a dog, so I'm expecting to hear a little critter, you know, 
coming through the grass and the leaves and what not, and I hear two footsteps. I hear something with two footsteps. Thump, thump, and it's coming towards me. Not a French poodle, not a German shepherd. Two distinct footsteps coming through, and you can hear the grass, and the walking and the dog chains are still clinking, clinking. That's about when my alarm bell went off. I'm thinking, okay, this is a problem. There's no way you can think this is anything but a problem. Something's wrong, and my ears are telling me that I ought to be able to see this thing, and it should be right there on the other side of the creek. This Canada just dragged on for about 20 minutes. It did just walk up. I'm thinking serial killer. I'm thinking something. I didn't know. Just bad. And I was ready to go because I should have seen it. My ears are telling me it should be there, but I couldn't see it. And I'm looking around trying to figure, should I go back to the right or should I go to the left? And I'm in New York, so it's not always a friendly place. And I'm out in the middle of this swamp and you can't see that good. To get to the back street of the neighborhood I was heading to, I had to make a left about 10 yards, go across the pipe to the right, go into the 25 yards, then up the side of the hill. It brings me to the dead end street, straight up there to the neighborhood, and I have about 30 more blocks to my house, and the trail on the other side went away from the creek. So whatever would have been done there on that bank would have had a 30-yard trip to where it was, and I had a 30-yard trip to where it was. So I got up and bolted. I figured I'd beat it. I hang to the left, run to the right, and I'm in full sprint. I'm the athletic type. I'm six foot two. And just where I got to the point where I would go up this hill, a ten or twelve foot shadow with red beady eyes stepped up from the bank and was standing right there. Ten or twelve feet. It had horns. I froze. It had horns. Just an outline. It was as dark as dark could be. All you could see is dark. All you see was an outline. Looking into this creature, it was as dark as night. Red beady eyes. Beady, not just glowing eyes. Red beady eyes. And I froze. I was just stuck. And I don't know how long I was there. I stood there contemplating some kind of communication coming at me, like step into me or something. I didn't know. But I didn't want to touch it, so I did what any red-blooded seventeen-year-old would do in this situation. I turned around and I ran. And I ran. And I didn't stop running. I ran all the way home. This was like forty blocks, you know. This was like two miles. I came home sweating, huffing. My parents kind of looked at me odd. I was well raised, you know. Yes, sir. No, sir. No, ma'am. Catholic boy. I was in an almost shock. I couldn't explain to them what happened. I didn't dare. They would have committed me. They would have sent me to private school or something. I told one person in my life. I grew up in Catholic schools and I tried to tell my priest. Bill asks what he thought the creature was. It was just a definition to figure out that life wasn't what I had figured out at that point. It was something that alienated me from what I considered normal. I was in the United States Air Force, 1962-1970, and volunteered to go to Vietnam in 1965. I got orders to go to Natrang, but when I arrived in Saigon, I was instead sent to Thailand and ended up at Uteran RTAFB, which in the north, close to the border of Laos. It was a small base with just a couple of hundred personnel. We didn't even have any jets, just prop planes. A couple of months after my arrival, the base started really ramping up. They built a whole new barracks area, and more personnel started arriving. I was an electronics tech in the communications service. We had a tiny comm center next to the runway. There were four vans with crypto gear parked next to each other with a Quonset hut for the teletype machine centered on the vans. There was a hooch we used as the shop and a couple of others for the radios and other comm equipment. We had wooden pallets laid out for sidewalks as it got pretty muddy during monsoon season. At the end of one walkway we had a water buffalo 
a big water tank on wheels that held our drinking water. During night shift, it was the newest guy's job to make coffee for everyone in a big urn. You'd carry the urn out to the water buffalo, fill it, bring it back, and do your thing. So one night, this had to be in early 67, as we were already living in the new barracks, but the new comm center wasn't completed yet. The new guy hauled the urn out to make coffee. After a while, somebody noticed he hadn't returned and went looking for him. He found the urn laying on the ground by the water buffalo, but no sign of the airman. We went on alert. The base was locked down, and a big search started. He was gone. Naturally, we all assumed he had been snatched by the Pathet Lao, Laos version of the Viet Cong. What we couldn't figure out was how they could have penetrated into the center of the base. And why grab an 18-year-old airman third-class teletype operator? Due to the treaty with Thailand, we couldn't carry arms, so it was up to the air police to tighten up security. We were pretty spooked. Probably a good thing we didn't have guns. Uh. So three days later, I was in my hooch, and a guy came running in saying they found the missing guy. They found him on the ground right next to the water buffalo. Now, the missing guy's hooch was right next to mine, so I went in there. A minute later, he came in, escorted by an AP, and started grabbing his stuff and throwing it in his duffel bag. I asked him what happened, and he said, I have been ordered not to talk about it. So I asked him where he was going, and he said to Japan. The app was very uncomfortable and told me not to talk to him, so I shut up. I looked him over as he packed and could see he was in fine shape. He was clean, and all I could see wrong were three or four scratches on his cheek. He finished up, said bye, and off they went. We never saw him again and never heard anything else about the matter. We all shrugged our shoulders and figured the path at Lyle weren't the type that beat up their captives. We couldn't figure how they penetrated the base twice, though. We figured it was just to intimidate us and things just went back to normal. I was happy when we got moved into the new comm center and away from that spooky spot by the runway. So, years later in the 90s, I was watching a TV show about alien abductions and they said something about the victims having skin samples scooped out of their cheeks. I suddenly flashed back to that event and remembered the marks on that airman's face. Could it have been... I've been fishing in Alaska for the last six summers with my dad. Never seen anything unexplainable, but have been creeped out a few times. A lot of it comes from lack of sleep, since we are out there for up to 60 hours at a time with no more than four hours between every time we put the net out. Anyway, here's a few things. I was on deck by myself late at night, and a tree wrapped in ball kelp got pulled on. Looked like some kind of giant squid. We've had a 600-pound shark caught in our net. That was scary. Caught two porpoises at once. They had already drowned when we got to them. Not so much creepy as it was startling. Then it was just sad. Found two oil drum-sized pieces of styrofoam about 300 yards away from each other. We figure they were tsunami debris. From the one that hit Japan in 2011. Interesting that they would stay so close together for so far found an acoustic guitar in its case floating near a beach. The strings had rusted away, but the body was in good shape. Really, the weirdest things are in my own head. I'll have waking dreams where I can't move or something very dangerous is happening. I sometimes wake up completely disoriented and nervous, which makes working hard. I should probably stop fishing. Anyway, today in the car on the way to the store, I was looking at the sky. It was about seven or eight at night, and I saw this strange thing in the sky. It had huge wings like a bat. It was like a dark brown color. There were no feathers at all. The body was black with short or no hair. It had a very slim body and a small tail. The thing about this bat creature was its size. It was bigger than a hawk. And in my town, we always see hawks, so I'm used to seeing them. I'm also used to seeing bats. This creature flapped its wings slowly, but the bats here usually flap their wings fast. 
That's the strange part for me. I could have sworn it was Petrodactyl. No one believes me. I just need to know what the hell I saw. Please help. To give you some context in 2020, when I got my first job as an order picker in a food processing company, being a very unsocial person, I managed to negotiate with my boss to work with the small night shift, 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. It's quite ridiculous because there's nothing good about being an order picker when you compare it with other jobs, but for me it was heaven. I could work on my own without having to interact with other people. One evening, my father dropped me off in front of the company at 9 p.m. and left. He couldn't take me any later because he was too tired to drive any later that night. So I sit down on the ground next to the building and start lighting up a cigarette and hanging out on my phone. A few minutes later, a man emerges from the darkness, well-dressed and well-groomed and carrying a rucksack. He walks over to sit on the ground next to me. At the time, he looked like an ordinary employee so I thought he must have forgotten the file and come back to get it. But the strange thing was that the building was still open, so the man could have gone straight in to get his papers. When I remembered, I was really scared and wondered what this man wanted and why he was sitting so close to me. Being paranoid by nature, I imagined all sorts of creepy things he could do to attack me, but fortunately, he didn't do anything. He just sat there and didn't move an inch, as if he'd become a statue. After several minutes of silence during which I stressed and he did literally nothing, it was 9.50 p.m., so I entered the building and the man did the same. I was even more worried, but then I remembered that the building had security cameras and that reassured me after all. Why would he attack me in the building which is secured by cameras when, outside, there were none? I made my way to the changing rooms to change into my prep outfit and saw that he'd taken a different one that led to the offices. This reassured me a little as it confirmed my theory that he was just an employee. Throughout my evening at work, I thought about this man and couldn't stop wondering why he had waited on the floor with me. One of the most likely scenarios I thought of was that he probably thought the door was closed and that I was waiting to be let in, and that by instinct he just sat down and waited with me without saying anything. For most of my shift, I was alone in my area and continued to work, except that at one point I heard a man coughing and turning around. I saw him. The man stood there straight as an eye, staring at me. When I noticed he was staring at me, I jumped up and asked, Can I help you? But the man said nothing and continued to stare at me blankly. After about two minutes, which seemed like hours, he walked towards me. My instincts were screaming at me to run away from this man. But I couldn't. I was stunned, and when he was less than two meters away, he put his hand in his pocket. I thought he was going to pull out a knife or something and stab me, but instead he pulled out a pack of cigarettes, still intact, handed them to me, and walked out. It was the same brand as the one I'd been smoking, but it didn't belong to me, for the simple reason that I buy my cigarette packs individually. And once this one is empty, I go and buy another but I never buy several packs at the same time. What's more, he could never have known what brand it was since I didn't take my pack out in front of him. After that, I never saw him again. I moved to another area that evening to talk to other colleagues, but they were dubious about my story. I also tried to tell my superiors, but they didn't believe me either because you need an access card to enter the building, and according to them, if, if this stranger was able to get in... He probably had one. The problem was that I was the one who opened the door, and the man simply walked through before it closed. Nevertheless, I continued to work there until the end of my contract, but I still don't know who this man is or what he wanted from me. Why did he sit so still next to me that night? Why did he follow me into an employee area? Why did he watch me for so long without saying a word? And why did he give me that unopened pack of cigarettes? My dad spent years at sea and has many stories from his time on tanker ships as an engineer. One time the ship was being slowed down by something they couldn't explain. Mechanically fine, 
turns out they had a large dead whale wrapped around the bow of the ship slowing them down. But the creepiest story was a simple one. The crew was shark fishing off the bank of a smaller tanker ship, basically attaching meat chunks to hooks and throwing them off the back to trawl in the ocean. Southeast Asia, Australia, Ira. My dad, for fun, made up this large steel alloy, described it as being incredibly durable, hooked to use. They attach a large chunk of meat to it and throw it off the back. A while later, they haul it back in, only to find the meat is gone and the hook is bent completely straight. There was nothing it could have snagged on in the deep ocean as the boat was driving through. My dad and the crew were sufficiently unnerved to think that something large down there could bend a large hook like that. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.